Is this the future of communication? Digital, artificial intelligence versions of ourselves. Well, Deepak Chopra thinks so. He has recently launched a digital version of himself, an avatar where he can not only coach you, give you his own recommendations on life, aspects of health, spirituality, and all the other personal development issues he deals with, but he can actually have his avatar take Zoom meetings with people and he doesn't have to show up. He was recently profiled on Good Morning America. Let's take a look and see what we think of this. I'm very bullish on the idea of using artificial intelligence to help experts share their expertise. But let's take a look. I want to know your opinions on this as well. Hello, Amy and TJ and everyone at GMA3. I'm so happy to be here to break the cycle of self-doubt. Okay, so you can see it does look like him. His mouth is moving. And the mouth does seem to be in sync with what he's saying. But there is something very, very artificial and contrived about it. Let's look a little more. Doubt, you must find the place inside yourself where nothing is impossible. Digital Deepak is my mind twin. So there he is. There he is real now. So this is not the artificial intelligent version of him. Now, I applaud Deepak Chopra for his willingness, his ability to send his message out using every format. Uh, he's someone who has certainly been a master of the publishing world and has published at this point close to 100 books, if not more so. He's a master of being a guest on talk shows and certainly did extraordinarily well with, uh, with his appearances on Oprah. Excuse me, one second. I accidentally started a record on my cell phone for no apparent reason. So let me just turn that off. Uh, we'll get to that later. He does podcasts. He posts on YouTube. He does a lot of things and he has, there's some controversy with him. We won't get into all that today, but regardless of your thoughts of any one of his positions, he has been a master at being a public intellectual and getting his ideas out there, sharing his ideas with the world and being a stellar communicator. Now, I find it interesting for another reason is he does have what a lot of people would call consider a traditionally somewhat strong Indian accent. I say that not as a criticism, but to point out to people around the world, it doesn't matter what your accent is as long as people can understand you. And people clearly understand Deepak Chopra. So, the issue is, would you be comfortable attending a webinar or using an artificial intelligence version of Deepak Chopra? Let's just take a look again. We're, st we're early in this game of using video, feeding it into neural networks, creating an avatar, and having it create things. So let's just listen again. Hello to Digital Deepak. Hello, Amy and TJ and everyone. At and I should point out, he wasn't saying hello to me, TJ. <laughs> uh, uh, he was saying hello to the host on Good Morning America, who's also named TJ. But the beauty of artificial intelligence, as we saw yesterday with political campaigns in India, is you could be an expert, a politician, any thought leader, and have your avatar speak directly to people using their name. So it's great at doing high level personalization. If you're sending out an email newsletter to a million people, we all know that there's a little function you put in almost any email program that inserts the first name of the person you're sending an email to. Well, the essentially the same thing that has worked for years in text can now work in video and audio. And it does freak some people out. What do you think? Let's take one more look at Deepak Chopra and see what we really think of this. And I've had a few comments come in. Great. And so Ben, you posted a link for me. Is this something I need to do now? I'm talking to my producer, Ben. Uh, ben, I can't hear you. Go ahead. Let me, let me just add, let me just add Ben. I want to make sure because we have a we got a fun show for you today. We got a, a fantastic interview coming up with 
with arguably the premier expert in the world on making small talk, which is a very important form of communication. Ben, I just want to make sure I didn't miss something on the private chat. Yeah, I wanted to post it on the comment, then I sent it to the private chat, so it was a mistake. Okay, gotcha, great. All right, thanks, Ben. Okay, so let's just look one more time briefly at this. Well, I'm gonna do split screen because I don't want Good Morning America to think I'm stealing their content. So just so you know, when you have a split screen and you're on it, you're arguably altering the content in a new format, less likely for anyone to accuse you of copyright violation. And I'm using very small clips. But we do thank Good Morning America for doing this interview with Deepak Chopra. So let's just look again at the first few seconds of this. And I want to get your sense of what you think. Hello, Amy and TJ and everyone at GMA3. I'm so happy to be here. To break the cycle of self-doubt, you must find the place inside yourself where nothing is impossible. Digital Deepak is my... So you can clearly tell a difference, although the audio quality in his digital version was actually superior to the audio quality he had going on uh, with his live interview. It appeared My to me he was, he was just using sort of a built-in microphone in his computer for that part. So uh, they did get good quality audio. Now that's a separate issue from whether it really sounded like a human being. So let's break it down what the AI has to improve on. The body was a bit stiff. The head was stiff. The neck was stiff. The lips were moving. The mouth was moving, but you can see when he's actually talking, let's just take a look. There's much more movement. Twin. I started creating. See how when he's moving, just there's a little bit of movement here. There's variation. We didn't see the variation when he was doing the talking. So I think that's a relatively easy thing to fix as artificial intelligence and video avatars, audio avatars, get better and better as they have more and more data. Now, something, someone like a Deepak Chopra has thousands of hours of video of him speaking from talk show appearances, podcast, his own YouTube channel. So I would think it would be relatively easy once you start feeding in all that raw data, because that's what artificial intelligence loves. Raw data and all this video of him speaking is raw data. I would think that it would be able to get better and better and actually mimic the way he moves his head, the way he leans forward, looks down, has an eyebrow go up and down. I didn't see that in this version, but it, again, it's early in the game. What do you think? Would you actually watch a video avatar of someone doing a show or doing a lecture or doing a live webinar? Or does that still feel creepy, cheesy, inauthentic to you? I'd like to hear from you. So post your comments. If you're watching this on demand, post your comments, and I will, in fact, respond to you. If this is your first time here, hi, I'm TJ Walker. This is the TJ Walker Success Channel. This is a channel devoted exclusively to helping you become more successful in life by boosting your communication skills and boosting your confidence in your communication skills. And we look at every aspect of the physical side of what do you do with your hands and your voice to the technical side? Like, should you be like Deepak and start using artificial intelligence to create an avatar of yourself? It may seem outlandish right now, but it's coming. Uh, certainly when I was a kid, the idea of speaking on video to someone, we saw it in cartoons on the Jetsons, but that seemed like something from three centuries in the future. And now, it's commonplace, obviously, to speak to someone using FaceTime or Zoom or Skype or something like that. So these things take a long time, and then all of a sudden, everyone's doing it, and it seems obvious. It seems just baked into our culture. This is something I'm profoundly interested in because I am always looking for ways of helping people to be more effective speakers. And my biggest frustration professionally is... When I can work one-on-one -on -one with someone, have them speak, we watch it together, I critique, I get them to focus on what's working well, to focus on one change to work on for the next one, there's always massive, massive improvement 
in their communication skills at the end of the day. Massive. And they don't mind paying a lot of money for private training. The breakdown for me has been when I convert my expertise to video on demand and someone has to watch it passively, you lose that interaction. And I, as much as I think my online video-based courses are the best in the world, I know I'm not getting the same response as when I can work one-on-one -on -one and it's personalized. So to me, the, the big hope is that artificial intelligence, digital video avatars can, can create an experience that is a lot closer to the live in-person one-on-one training than it is the more passive laid back video experience where it's video on demand. We've got a lot in store for you today. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, I'm going to begin my interview with Don Gabor, who is one of the preeminent experts in the world on small talk. Now you may say, well, I don't like small talk. I'm, I just deal with important stuff. Don't kid yourself. The most important thing in your life is your, your relationship. The most important things in your life are your relationships with friends, family, colleagues. That's what you remember on your deathbed. It's not, I should have done one more big special report or one more social media video. So I urge you, please come back if you have to leave, but watch this interview I do with Don Gabor. It's going to be a lot of fun and exciting. So before we do that, I want to hop in and make some short form videos. Those of you who watch this regularly know this is kind of a show within a show within a show. I talk to you. I always give you precedence when it comes to what you want to talk about, your questions, your concerns, anything you want to share. But we also use this as my workshop where I actually take you behind the scenes and show you what a content creator does. I show you the rough drafts of everything I do. So like a lot of people, I have short form, long form edited, polished videos on my social media channels. But what's different is I actually show you how I make them. You see the rough drafts. You see the stumbles. You see that I occasionally mess up, have to say cut, and we do it over. And you'll also see me just do everything fine for 20, 30 seconds, make a stumble. I'll pause, say no to editor, cut out that last sentence, and then I'll just start again. And that way it's fast, it's easy, it keeps things going quickly. Oh, you know, one of the things I forgot to do yesterday, which I should have done, is go through any questions that have been emailed. Because we do give people an opportunity to email in questions as well. And forgive me, but I do think I missed a few of those this week. Okay, here's a question from Subham who writes, my question is that I overthink a lot. And before doing anything, I think a thousand times and I don't like it. That's why my mindset instigates me to think 10 times. How can I change this habit? Well, that certainly sounds like rumination. And everybody ruminates from time to time. Uh, it is normal, but if you do it too much, it can take things to an extreme and paralyze you. Certainly, if you're thinking about something a thousand times, that's too much. The problem so many people have is they get locked in this sentiment of just thinking and it creates paralysis. So with respect to speaking or creating your own video on social media, I know people who've thought about, you know, I'm going to say what I say in my speeches or my book. And they're thinking about it for six months and they never hit record. You need something to change that, to, to break that pattern. My recommendation is go to your calendar right now and put on your calendar, this is the time I'm going to produce a video. And it could be a week from now. Ideally, it would be today. But let's say it's tomorrow. I'll give you one last chance to think about it. And then put on the calendar a deadline for when you're going to publish it. You may or may not edit it the first couple thousand videos I ever did for my online courses and my social media channels, not a single bit of editing. And a lot of those courses did really well. So don't use the editing as an excuse. So I'm urging you, please 
just put on your calendar a time to do it. Because once you put it on the calendar and you set things into motion and you do your speech, your social media video, whatever it is, your webinar, you've recorded, you've uploaded it, then it's gone. It's out there. It's not nearly as tempting to think about it any longer. So someone that would be my recommendation on what to do with this, this excessive rumination. Anita writes in with the following question, how to get rid of imposter syndrome. I have the expertise. I've practiced a couple of times, but when the moment appears in the audience, or even I am recording myself, I'm not able to bring my relaxed self. Okay. That's a very common phenomenon. I think the important thing is to realize it doesn't matter if you're relaxed. Your audience can't read your mind. The only thing an audience can do is judge you based on what they see you're doing with your hands, your body, your, your voice. They can judge you by what you're doing or not doing physically and what they hear. They can't really judge your inner space, what you're thinking. Use that to your advantage. So if you know in advance you have something interesting to say to that audience and you're going to say it and your hands are going to move and you're going to gesture and you're going to have good eye contact the way people assume confident people do, then after a while you can just do that. It's okay to think, oh, I'm still nervous. I'm not comfortable. It's okay if you know you're giving them good information and you're doing things with your voice with your hands, with your body that people associate with comfortable speakers, then at some point you realize, okay, I'm coming across well to them and you can catch up. You'll start to feel better about it because you know you'll do well. That's a fantastic question. I'm going to do a short form video on that. So we're going to switch to camera two. I'm going to hit record. What if you suffer from imposter syndrome? You prepare, you get all ready, but still you think, oh, I'm too nervous to do this. Well, guess what? Keep practicing on video till you like what you see. Then if you're in front of the real audience or a camera, realize they can't read your mind. Just give them good information. Eventually you'll feel better. So I don't know how I feel about that. That's a hard one for me to do in a short form context. I think it may have lost something. So I'm not sure people would find that as helpful as what I said in the longer format. So I do appreciate the question. Imposter syndrome does get to a deeper area where people hold themselves back because you can always point to someone and say, well, that person has more academic credentials. That person has more years of experience. That person has a bigger client list. If you compare up You'll always convince yourself you're no good. So you just have to stop comparing. All you have to do is compare your knowledge base with someone you are talking to. If you have more knowledge that can help them, then you've got all the credibility you need. In fact, let me, <laughs> I think I've accidentally stumbled upon something important. So let me try to do a short form on that one. Go to camera two. Do you have imposter syndrome? You feel like this person has more credentials, more experience, more clients than you do. Well, realize that's not the comparison. All you have to have is more knowledge and expertise than the person you're speaking to. When you have that, you're the real thing. Okay, note to editor. I think the, the previous one I did, you should scrap. I think that one was a lot better. Okay. So what did I do there? That's something I occasionally do, not that often, but I'd recommend it. Talk out a rough draft. Every great author will tell you the secret to writing is rewriting. The secret to writing a great novel is throwing away your babies, meaning stuff you spent a lot of time creating and you realize eh, it's not good enough, throw it away. I don't do it that often, but I did try to do it right there where <laughs> I essentially want to delete the previous one because I don't think it was good as my second version of it. So that's why it's good to talk some of these things out. That's also why it's good, frankly, to speak 
more often because a lot of the best speakers in the world are constantly using stuff from old speeches and adding it sometimes spontaneously. That is exactly what Martin Luther King Jr. did in his I Have a Dream speech. He had one speech, started giving it, and people in the audience started saying, tell me about the dream, Martin. And he switched it to his own mind of speech he'd given several other times within the past year. So please keep that in mind. Now, one of my students wrote a question in Spanish. Now, I could have taken the time in advance to translate it, but I do apologize. Uh, English is unfortunately the only language I'm fluent in, but I can try to do a better job of translating it. You might want to translate it before submitting it too. Here's a question from Manuel. How can you achieve your goal in a faster way for this 2024? So, Manuel, one challenge I'd have for you is to really ask yourself, what's the hurry? I realize we all like to be thinner, richer overnight, but that unfortunately is probably the biggest reason so many of us don't reach our goals. We want a quick fix. We want to you know, lose 30 pounds in two weeks eating chocolate donuts. So I would ask you to really scrutinize what is what in fact is the hurry? You can become fabulously wealthy on almost any income if you simply spend 20% less than what you make, regardless of your income. And you take all that money and you invest it in a broad-based index fund. Pretty much anyone can be a millionaire in almost any, any Western industrialized nation if you consistently don't spend 20% of your income. And yet no one... I won't say no one. Very few people want to do that. They want to get rich now. They want to spend now. The single biggest thing beyond that, Manuel, I would recommend is you've got to look at your goals every day. You have to then break down what your goals are into daily habits. And you've got to give yourself reminders, audio, text, video format, which is what I recommend in all of my personal development courses. So, you know, one of my goals is to reach a million people a day across all social media. But if I just sort of sat there and made a video once a month and said, gosh, I hope, how do I do this faster? Wouldn't help. So instead, I'm experimenting every single day, putting out typically three, four videos a day on eight, sometimes nine social media platforms, constant experimentation. Some things work, some things don't. But I know I'm not going to reach my goal faster just by thinking about it or hoping or looking for shortcuts. So hope that's helpful. Other questions that have come in, and again, I do always try to respond to anyone who takes the time to write in specific questions about any aspects of my online courses or anything that relates to communication skills and also personal development. I do have about 50 or so personal development courses that are not strictly focused 100% on communication skills. And I just want to make sure I'm not missing any other questions that have been sent in. I think we are pretty much caught up on people who wrote in. Uh, here's one I missed from last week. How to criticize one of my colleagues for not permitting the duties sincerely. So criticizing colleagues is a tough, touchy issue. I think that you've got to ask yourself, first of all, is it your place? If you're brand new and there's a colleague who doesn't report to you and does things the way you don't like, do does anyone want to hear from you on this? Or are you just getting yourself into trouble? It, if it's not doing jeopardy, if it's not putting the organization in jeopardy, perhaps it's not the place for you to criticize. Now, let's say it is someone that you are in charge of managing, someone on your team. Maybe they report to you directly, but maybe it's an informal thing. You have no formal power. The best way to criticize is to start off by cataloging strengths it's just human nature. If you just start off with, this is awful, people defend themselves. So you're always better off not just starting with an attacker. Here's why you're wrong. Here's why you're foolish. Here's why you're screwing up. Start off 
letting them know you care about them, you have the same mission, here are your strengths, here's what you're doing well, and then focus on one thing you think they could do better that would benefit them and the organization. And try to end on a positive note of why you like working with them, why you want to continue collaborating with them, and why if everyone works together in a more positive way, good things can happen. So that would be my recommendation on the most effective way to criticize people. Hi, I'm TJ Walker. This is the TJ Walker Success Channel. If you're new here, this is the one place you can come and ask any question that relates to communication skills, whether it's small talk, giving speeches, presentations, PowerPoint talks, speaking to the media, going on live national TV, being interviewed on someone's YouTube channel. This is the place where you can ask questions, where together we try to grow and improve our communication skills and improve our confidence in our communication skills. So that's what we're all about. If you have questions, you can type them in to the chat. You can also appear right on camera with us through the power of StreamYard. The link is in the comments section right now. You click that and you can come join us. We're relatively free form here. We spend a lot of time. Typically, I'm here with you 9 to noon, Monday through Friday, Eastern time. Additionally, we put out three separate videos every single day, seven days a week, trying to give you more tips, tricks, and tools on how to be a better communicator. I'm extremely happy to have one of the world's foremost experts on small talk joining us right now, Don Gabor. Don, how are you? Oh, I'm not hearing the audio. Let's do, and we're in sort of our, our pre-interview section right now. So we're gonna experiment and tweak some things. Yeah, hit your mic. Let's test our audio, Don. That's, uh, that's the first time I've ever heard that. Something is coming out, Don, that sounds like a Mickey Mouse squeak. Try muting one more time. Oh, I know what I need you to do. I need you to check the settings on StreamYard. You should see something just like Zoom. All these things have settings. What often happens is someone has a good quality mic on and then they go into StreamYard for the first time and StreamYard will automatically take the, the microphone from a webcam or an earpiece that's low quality. So if you don't mind checking your settings in StreamYard for audio and make sure that it's the best possible microphone that you intend to have. Here and now go. I'm not hearing anything. Is that better? Nah, now we're hearing something. Great. Uh, okay, was it better? Yes. I'm hearing things, but interestingly, it's it's now we're like a 1950s Godzilla movie where <laughs> the audio's <laughs> not tracking with your mouth yet. So how how about this? <clears throat> Let me go back to what I had before. Now we're getting a little bit better. Okay. And uh, are you on a Wi-Fi? Are you on a plug-in? No, I'm on a, just an old-fashioned plug-in to the desktop uh, camera on top of my monitor. Okay. Well, that's usually that's usually the best way of doing it. And, and for folks joining us on live, Don and I go way back. He has been a former president of the NAT. I'm going to give him a formal introduction that we okay, use for our edited can for our edited podcast shortly. But just so those of you who are sort of our insiders watching live, Don is one of the most successful, well-known experts in the world on the art of small talk. And lest you think, well, I'm an important person. I don't bother with small talk. Don't kid yourself. Small talk is the foundation of relationships, friends, family, the most important aspects of human life. So. Small talk is actually something profoundly big and important to your life and to my life. And we're very happy that Don is here. I met Don, I guess, almost 20 years ago at the National Speakers Association. Yeah. And Don was a former president of the New York chapter. And it really has a wealth of information. And we're looking forward to our conversation with him today. Don, I know you've done thousands of interviews. 
And we're sort of in our pre-interview stage. You've done big ones, New York Times, and CNN, everywhere. What, what can we do in this interview to make this one special, where we've covered new ground, something that you, you're going to want to put it on your website at dongabor.com. What's the sort of thing that where you feel like, wow, I would, if I were doing this interview, I really would have gone in this direction, and, <laughs> and reporters, hosts typically don't do it. Uh -huh. Do uh, am I coming through at least a little bit better now? Yes, now we're hearing okay, you. Well, fine. that's step number one. You got to get across to your audience, and of course, uh, here's here's my answer to that question—a short answer—and that is, I believe every conversation, every interview, every interaction is really public speaking, and there's an opportunity for people to practice how they communicate just almost every moment of the day. So when it gets back to how to become a better uh, media spokesperson or how to uh, communicate with a client more effectively through through the media, <laughs> have your microphone working properly always helps. Uh, technology can, can be an asset or a, a hindrance depending. Uh, but I think, you know, getting back to the, the main point is to to recognize what will have an impact on your listener or on the person that, with whom you're communicating and people or, or individuals and, and treat them as individuals in a genuine way. And I, I think that if you do those things, aside from all the other elements of being a good presenter, uh, I think you will come across in a, in a more effective way. Mm -hmm. I agree with you completely, but I found that so many people in the world, the second you say public speaking, they're like, oh no, I don't ever give public speak. I'm not a public speaker. And yet there's they're giving a presentation to 20 colleagues every Monday morning. They have an opportunity to ask a question in a board <laughs> room. And I think of those as public speaking in a sense. Anytime it's outside of your own brain, it's essentially public to someone. But people tell themselves it's so different. And the problem with that is they then say, well, I'm bad at that because I don't do that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, TJ. And this is where I, I, from my perspective and how I have always presented this information in terms of small talk and, and just communication skills in general and conversation skills specifically, is that whenever you are communicating, it's out in public. So whether it's to one individual or to 10, or to 50 or to a thousand or, you know, anywhere, any number of people, it, what you're, what you're saying is being sent out. And it's very different to what remains inside your head and how you think about things and how you feel about things. And I, I believe that part of the, the skill of being a good communicator is to connect that interior dialogue with what's going out. And this is where people sometimes, you know, they're thinking one thing and it gets in the way of what it is that they really want to communicate. And whether it be fears or, you know, whether I'm looking good or sounding good, or am I going to impress somebody, all these things can, can interfere. So if you practice as an individual, just going to the store and communicating with a, um, a spouse or a neighbor, this is going to facilitate that that connection and that ability to connect inner and outer voice. How do you teach people the art of truly being present in a conversation? Because the problem so many people have, in fact, I've been guilty of it a little right now because I'm thinking while listening, to you, <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I got to make sure I don't forget when we go on Amazon live, I want to, I want to not forget to hold up, the book that we want to present, how oh, to start oh, a you mean, conversation you mean this, and make you mean friends. This book? <laughs> yes. And we'll be talking about that more. We want to hear all about it. Yeah. But it, even I'm guilty of that. Certainly when I'm doing a show, because I'm pushing mixer buttons and I'm trying to figure out, do I want to do this angle? Do I want to... Uh, do that angle. What happened to your voice? I... I've lost your audio. Uh, oh, well, I took my audio off. So, <laughs> See, this so again, that's something else I have to think of. Now, mm -hmm. not everyone is trying to do a simulcast show all the time, but uh, 
we're all guilty from time to time of talking to someone. We just met someone. We're thinking about how can I say something clever? How can I know they're talking about their vacation? How can I talk about my vacation? How do you really build a new habit of really listening to someone? This is this is an essential question that people really need to have a good answer to. And uh, I think with all the distractions that we have, and you know, I could list them off, you know, by the score. Uh, this is one of the biggest hindrances of having a, a good conversation with somebody: is what am I going to say? What am I going to have for dinner? Are the kids going to be okay? You know, all these things are kind of percolating. And my answer to how do you stay focused into a conversation is to really listen. Now, that's a very broad uh, suggestion. And so what I would encourage people to do is not just be a good listener, because that's everybody wants to be a good listener, but how do you be a good listener? And the way I have, I was corrected the same way you maybe have been corrected at one point, good talker, but you're not listening as carefully as you need to. This happened to me a while, a long while ago, and I thought, mm, you're right. And so the, the answer to your question is to listen for certain kinds of things. Keywords. Those are words that paint pictures. Listen for kind of between the lines. What are people really trying to communicate that they just quite can't quite get out? Maybe they want to talk about something, but they're afraid to say what they're really interested in. And so you have to listen carefully to pick up signals, body language signals, tone of voice, whatever it may be, particularly key words and, and what I call iceberg statements that are words that imply something more that the person wants to talk about. Then when you ask a question or share a, a limited amount of sharing and of a related experience or a common interest, what happens there is you're focusing. You're focusing on that other person. And what the result of that's gonna be is the person's gonna think, oh, this person's interested in what I just said. Wow, I like him. You know, he's got good judgment, you know, and, and it, it's not a false kind of interaction. It's just a way to focus your attention, because I think studies have shown that supposedly, and I don't know, you know, how valid this is, but supposedly we are not capable of thinking two different thoughts simultaneously. So excuse me while I drive down the road and yeah. text at the same time and run over your kid. Yeah, pretty much. So that's the short answer. Focus on what the other person is saying. Pick up on some keywords. Start to interact. The biggest problem people have, have when they start to kind of drift away out of a conversation is they're not participating in it. They're letting the other person maybe talk too much or they're not, they're not offering enough to give the other person an opportunity to show interest, you know, going the other way. Mm -hmm. Don, before we really hop in with a formal interview, Let's step back for a minute. You're you're not only an accomplished author, you've written a dozen books, you've written more books than a lot of people have read. <laughs> and you're very accomplished in the print medium. You hold workshops and seminars, but you also have done a great job of promoting your books and gotten yourself on your books mentioned in 60 minutes and things like that. What have you noticed helps you sell the most books? and promote the most effectively? Because the, the media landscape has changed a lot since you and I oh, really got started in yeah. this around 1980. Yeah. And some people like a Tim Ferriss will say, hey, I'd much rather go on a podcast like The Art of Charm than go on the Today Show on NBC. What have you found really helps you? And what, what kind of interviews do you enjoy the most? And which ones help you reach more people and sell more books? Well, this is sort of the 64 gazillion dollar question for authors. And, and you're right, the landscape has changed a lot. Uh, I've been doing this since 1983. All right. And, you know, there was no internet and, you know, a lot of things have changed. And I, I think one of the things that has been key, at least for my subject area, is that the topic is an evergreen topic. So, from that, what that means is that it's a topic that will never really go away. It's like the evergreens. They just keep growing. They don't die off in the winter and come back in the summer. So the topic is really key 
to continuing to have interest. Every day I see more conversation books, more articles. I just saw an article yesterday in, in the Wall Street Journal about conversation skills and small talk. I, it, I wasn't interviewed for it, but that helps my subject stay in front of other people, younger people, newer people in, in the business world, college graduates, high school kids who want to, you know, be more popular, whatever it might be. So from that standpoint, topic is important. As far as reaching the media, I, you know, like authors, like many authors, sometimes I, I do some things and then I kind of fall back. But I try to be available. If anybody calls me and wants to hear what I have to say, I, I'm happy to share. The, the interviews that I like the best are the ones where people give me a little bit of extra time to share a little bit of knowledge. And that's what I'm about. You know, I, I don't tell people how to use their skills specifically. I mean, I, I don't make a judgment on whether they're using them for a dating site or a business site or, or what it is. That's, that's not my role. My role and what I believe makes my books popular is they're easy to read. They are very specific to the skills that are involved. And I slice those skills very thin, meaning that I take what people just assume, well, everybody knows body language. Everybody knows how to ask questions. Well, not really. <laughs> mm -hmm. so that's what is, is the type of interviews I like are the ones that give me a little bit of openness to, to address those issues so that listeners or media people who are uh, reading an article or listening to a podcast can get something out. It's just like a presentation. Uh, uh, of public speaking. What do you want the audience to go away with mm -hmm. that they haven't had before? And that's those are the kind of interviews that I like. And what do you, I mean, when I do a media training with someone, I always ask the client, if it's an author, what is the, at most, three ideas you want your audience to remember? And then what do you want them to do? If it's an <clears throat> author, typically you want them to buy the book. <laughs> But what do you what would you say? And because you've got a book, you've got a dozen books with thousands of ideas. Yeah. If we could take a a memory stick from you and put it into the heads of our audience and get them to remember three ideas, what would those be? I think the first and most important thing when you're communicating with people is to look for common interests. This is a point of connection. Whenever I'm talking to anybody, I, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for some way for us to connect. It could be through experience. It could be through proximity where we live. It, it could be, uh, it, it doesn't even matter. But that's number one. And number two is to show interest in people. This, this is paramount because this is what makes people want to talk to you. They, they want your, your, and I know this may sound strange, but I believe people want really two things from you. They want your attention and they want your approval. And they, the, uh, attention means that you're showing interest in listening. And approval means that you not approve of what they do, but that you accept them and their right to have their point of view and opinions and all that, even though you may disagree. So I think this, these are two things. And then the third thing is, to balance the amount of talking and listening that you do. There's some people that are very good talkers and some people are very good listeners, but you have to have a balance of the two to make conversation communication really effective. So those are my three things. Okay, great, great clarity there. I mean, I always find a good communicator can talk about their main area of expertise in 30 hours, 10 hours, an hour, <laughs> 30 minutes, 10 minutes, 60 seconds, or 30 seconds. You, you, it's an accordion, and you did that beautifully. Thank We're going to start our formal TGA. interview in just a few minutes. Okay. But I have your bio, but tell me, what do you think, how would you like me to introduce you in a way that you think is most enticing to an audience to make them want to really hear from you? I think for this interview, TJ, the power of small talk uh, is really, and the power of conversation and, and how it relates to public speaking and communicating in any format, whether it be media 
or in person. And uh, I think if you put me in that frame, that's where I'm most effective. I'm not a technology type. I can't operate a lot of buttons at once without having everything go crazy. But I'm pretty good with connecting with people. And that's that's okay. what I like to show people to do. And small talk is the vehicle. Great. And I want to practice some of your your best tips and your practice, which is listening to others. Right now, I'm listening to VL has written in a comment. Number one, mention the book. Number two, refer to the book in all replies. I have a whole chapter about this. Number three, mention the book. Okay. It, there's certainly a lot of people who do believe that and think about that. And there's, it can work sometimes. There are other times where I've seen it really alienates the host <clears throat> and alienates the audience. Uh -huh. And so I would urge you, maybe not every sentence, maybe when it's, it's completely appropriate and try to come back to recurring themes. Because when I see the, the most successful authors who aren't just also famous talk show hosts like Dr. Phil, but someone like a, a Alan Dershowitz, the attorney, mm -hmm. I think their power with the media in promoting their books and getting their books onto the top of the New York Times bestseller list is they're just constantly interesting guests. That's true. And they might not even mention their book, but mm -hmm. they're in the media. They're so prominent all the time yeah. that they have such name ID. People saw them on five different TV shows in the last three weeks, and then they see their book in an airport bookstore. Like, oh, that guy. And they buy it. So there are different ways of going about that. But VL, very much appreciate your perspective. And again, if you do have questions for Don, you can post them right here. You can even come on the screen and talk to Don and get his advice on a particular small talk situation. I know I've, I've got a lot of questions I don't know the answer to that I'm still trying to figure out. So we're going to be doing that. But first, we're going to take, uh, we're going to get ready for our live session now. And we're going to take a short break, get everything technically ready. We'll be coming back after our Amazon live section for more for more Q&A with Don as well. And uh, Janet writes in, thanks for interviewing Don Gabor. Uh, these three things, one, common points. Number two, interesting guests. Number three, not talk, not over talking, a balance between listening and speaking. And Janice, with unconventional advice that works, is it's, it's great to hear from you and great insights as well. So, Don, I'm going to give you a, a quick break to get a fresh cup of coffee or tea or water. We'll be back in about two minutes, and then we'll be hopping in. Ben, my producer, will get us all ready to go live and give us the countdown for Amazon Live. So we'll be back in, in just – oh, i got to pull up the – did I thought – oh, yeah, got it right here. All right part of the family. Go. I use it every day. I carry it with me to the pickleball court every day. I live in South Florida where it is hot. Video cameras and this and my laptop in one bag. I put it over my shoulder on the plane and it allows me to go anywhere in the world with tripod. Ready. This Sony condenser microphone is the one I've used for years and years for all of my YouTube videos. It gives clear powerful audio. It is professional in every sense. Sony, of course, well-known, well-deserved reputation for electronic excellence. If you're looking to up your game, try the Sony condenser microphone today. Of course, you want to look your best. I want to look my best, but you want to sound your best too. That's why I always put in a microphone into my iPhone 15. This microphone works perfectly. It boosts my sound. I don't have to get right next to my cell phone. I can be further away and the audio still sounds great. You're going to want to use this microphone if you want to create professional looking and sounding videos. Have you ever looked inside your computer? Chances are it is filled with dust, dirt. How do you get it clean? I use the CompuCleaner too. This is a very, very powerful, powerful airflow. It gets rid of the dust. It gets rid of the dirt. It does not damage your computer. 
So if you wanna really give your computer a nice spring cleaning, this is the tool for you. It's highly effective. I've had mine for years. It continues to do a great job. This Logitech wireless mouse is extraordinarily reliable and durable. I've had it for about 10 years. It still works well. I've even broken the back off. On down and then badly scratched. I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't have to worry about running and almost diving and the glasses just flying off. With these straps, I feel secure that my glasses are right where I want them and I can focus on what I'm really after, which is the exercise. Okay, we're back live. Those were some ads, Don, I hear you chuckling. Those are ads that I do for the Amazon Influencer Program. And the Amazon Influencer Program, it lets people with just a, a sort of a bare minimum of a few followers on social media make ads for products they like and believe in, such as how I'm about to do for this book, How to Start a Conversation and Make <laughs> Friends. And what's different about it is... You don't have to go out and find your own mass following and be as popular as Kim Kardashian. You can make a review of a product. Amazon then puts that video on the actual product page. If someone watches your video and then buys the product, you get a little commission. So I'm going to, at our end of our segment, I'm going to be making an ad for this book. And if all goes according to the way things normally go, my video will be right there on your page. And I would I would point out to people that Don didn't pay me for this. His publisher didn't do this. This is a book I've actually bought with my own money, read, underlined, <laughs> and referred to other people as well. So that's what makes the Amazon Influencer Program interesting. You can just pick products you like. So we're going to hop right in and... Uh, a few more comments came in. BL says, from now on, all comments should have three clear points. I do <laughs> think it's a great mindset. And certainly what I recommend in my media training is don't just give a short, quick answer. Try to bridge to three points to make it more conversational, to make it like a flowing conversation between two friends. So VL, you're absolutely right. Okay, so we're going to hop right in. And Ben, if you give us a countdown on, uh, I'm going to go to single shot and then I'll bring you in, Don. And <clears throat> Ben, you'll give me the countdown and we'll go ahead and be live on Amazon. Ben, I lost you. So uh, Ben, I'm not seeing you. So I can't see if you're giving me the indication we're on. Uh, <laughs> now, so what happens from time to time is we have internet connection issues. Ben is in a, a different city and a different continent than I'm in. And what we have not done is, well, I think he hit live and we are live. So welcome to all of our friends on Amazon Live. I'm TJ Walker. Thanks so much for joining me today. We have a very, very special guest and author. And we live in an era where, Ben, I assume we're live now. Is that correct? Oh, we're not. Okay. So we lost you for a minute. I'm going to need you to give me a countdown. I can't hear you, Ben. Your audio's off. Uh, ben, if we're live, I need you to go thumbs up. Okay. All right. Three, two, one. Welcome to Amazon Live. I'm TJ Walker. We have an exciting, exciting guest for you today. We live in an era where, thanks to Amazon, everybody can be an author and it's easy to self-publish. And I, hey, I've done that, nothing wrong with that. But we have the real deal here, an author who has published more than a dozen books, published in 15 languages, Simon & Schuster, Random House, the top publishing houses in the world. We're really fortunate to be with him. Our guest today is one of the most internationally renowned experts 
on the art of small talk, an extraordinarily important aspect of communication. He has trained major corporations all over the world, done private seminars, workshops, teaching people the art of small talk. He's been a major spokesperson. You've probably seen him in the media talking about Sprint, other major corporations. His books have been featured in the New York Times and CBS 60 Minutes, which to our friends outside of the United States, that was a really big, big deal here in the United States where typically the top rated show in any given week. I'm very, very happy to introduce the author of this book, How to Start a Conversation and Make Friends. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Don Gabor with us today. Don, how are you? I'm well, TJ. How are you? Fantastic. Great. So, Don, I'm sure people ask you this, but how did you get into the small talk niche? Were you the most popular, voted most popular in high school? Were you yeah, the president the most, of your fraternity? What happened? Yeah, the most popular, the most handsome. You know, I had it all. <laughs> Uh, I, I think the way I got into it was that I was always interested in, and had fun talking to people as a kid and as a teenager. And, you know, as I grew up, I, I, I saw that there was a real benefit to connecting with people. I could find out a lot of things that I didn't know and people could help me achieve some of the things that I wanted to get out of life and and learn things. But in, in the professional world, I, I became a small talk um, proponent in 1981 in here in New York City, teaching a workshop with about 30 adults. It was a, a, a non-credited workshop, an adult education workshop on how to start a conversation. And I had been asked to teach this workshop. And but I didn't just walk in there just because I knew how to talk to people. I spent several months researching the topic uh, with the you know, the real experts of that time, that being Dale Carnegie and some others. And what I found was that there was a lot of assumption. People would say, go out and start a conversation with people, but they never really said how. And what I did to kind of briefly condense a, a lot of work into what went into this was I defined along with topics of, of skills, but, but ways that people actually interact and communicate with people. And, and put them in a format that people could learn in three hours. And that's where it all began, was in a how to start a conversation workshop uh, in an adult ed program in New York City. And it became very popular. And just uh, as a, a launching point, at that point, cassette tapes had just been invented. There were the, six, the, the eight track tapes, you know, those big clunky things. But uh, I had an opportunity to record a 60 minute or 45 minute audio program in a office somewhere with a little tape recorder and a guy. And that became Walden books, number one bestseller. And it all started from there. And a book came out of that and career of teaching people. Wow, that, that's a great place to start. And again, I was fortunate enough to, to read an earlier version of your book that, that came out quite a while ago, but you do update it. And again, to record, to point out to people right now, the book is available with one click. Those of you watching us on Amazon. So, uh, and I just want to pull it up. Go ahead and hold up the copy of the book, Don, so people can see it. So when they're clicking on it, but this is the book, the digital version, the real, ver I have, the, I bought the real version. And again, I should point out, Don didn't pay me to do this. His publisher didn't. I bought the book with my own money, read it, underlined it, used it and referred to it. And that's why I am in fact, recommending it to my Amazon community right here. If you want to buy the book, it's in the carousel below. You can watch it. If you have questions for Don, you can post your questions right there in the chat on Amazon. And Ben, you're monitoring that for us. So you will alert us, presumably, any questions or comments coming in. Now, Don, so much of just small talk is evergreen. It's really something that's gone on for what 200,000 years since human beings have have been able to communicate through language if not longer so it's hardwired into us to connect as human beings and to want someone to listen to us mm -hmm. to respect us but some things change I, I need your advice on what the most effective way is you're talking to someone maybe a friend 
and they're doing this. They're checking their phone. They're swiping. It drives me crazy, yet I don't want to be the bad guy and say, hey, jerk face, I'm right here. Put your <laughs> damn phone away. I don't want to do, I don't want to be that guy. But I also feel like the person's being incredibly rude. How do you handle situations like that? You, you put your finger on a very current type of problem that because of technology and everything else, we're, we're just, you know, it's, it's our, our heads are just surrounded by distractions, some internal, some external. The ones you are describing are external. And those are things that you can do something about being the person. First of all, if you're the person who's doing all those things, the number one thing to do is to stop doing that because what it really shows is you're not paying attention. You don't care. Um, you don't absorbing anything that the person is trying to communicate. And it may be really critical to that other person. You might think, oh, this sounds kind of boring. But what the person is really trying to get across to you may be very important to him or her in more than ways that you might initially understand. So from the standpoint of being the person who's doing this, stop. To, to, to ask somebody to stop, it depends. And you have to, every conversation it has to be dealt with separately because in certain situations, it would be okay to say, hey, would you mind just putting your phone down for a second? I really want to talk to you. That might be okay if you're talking to someone who you are familiar with, a family member or a friend, but it probably wouldn't be appropriate to talk to a client like that. And that might seem obvious, but at the same time, you have a limited amount of time with a client and you want to get your point across. So tact is is a big part of this you might say well just tell me when you're ready and and we can continue you know our conversation about xyz and that's a sort of an indirect way of saying um i i really like your full attention so you have to mm -hmm. you have to use tact if you want to make that statement to somebody but sometimes you just have to say hey man would you mind putting your phone down let's let's we don't get that much time to chat with each other let's take advantage of it that's a great way of doing it. I hadn't, hadn't thought of that. That's a, that's a great tip right there. I've learned I've learned something right away. So, Don, you're an internationally renowned expert on small talk, have been for, for decades. Do you ever have small talk that just goes the wrong way? And do you have family and friends who say, ah, you're no, I can't believe you talk about that? And because a lot of times those of us who consider ourselves experts, we're not considered experts to our family members. And there's the very well-known oh, personal development guy, Wayne Dyer, who's no longer with us, who famously said you know, when he, his daughter came up to him one day and said, you wrote a book on how to co communicate with family and raise children. And she couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> so it, a lot of times it is hard to impress those who are closest to us. Have you had negative reactions with people in your own small talk? Because I know I have. I think when you brought that up, the first thing that came to my mind was that somewhere along the line, I was talking with somebody and the person said to me, you know, Don, you really need to improve your listening skills. You like to talk and you're good at talking, but your listening skills really need to improve. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. You interrupt me. You interrupted me. And bingo. And I learned something right there. And it was a very, you know, it was a little bit of a slap on the wrist, I admit it. But it was well-deserved. And I realized in my style of communication, the way I grew up and the family I grew up with, if you wanted to get a word in, you got to you gotta interrupt. That, that was the way it was. And I didn't realize that that style had kind of, bled over into my other communications. And so this is what I would, you know, recommend to people who like to talk, you're one of those and so am I, that not everybody feels comfortable at that level of speech. And so to pull back a little bit, I had to stop talking at times, not have to share every little bit of information or not have to dom, I don't feel like I'm dominating the conversation, I just like the interaction. So these are a couple of things that I learned along the way uh, among several that, that have helped me improve 
and they were weaknesses in my ability to communicate. And I think this is the big point, no matter how good you are, and I think this is in any, any aspect of life, whether it's a, you're an athlete or a, a, a entrepreneur or whatever you are, there's things you're good at, and that's why you have succeeded up to that point. But there's also elements that need to be addressed, that um, weaknesses that can be mitigated, that can kind of balance those things out to push you even further up that ladder of success, if that's where you want to go. I'm so proud of myself because I wanted to interrupt you a couple <laughs> minutes ago and say, yes, yes, I'm guilty of interrupting people too. And I had to really fight <laughs> and hold it in because I'm guilty I know, of that. I know. I feel I'm your guilty pain. Of that I feel too. your pain. <laughs> I'm guilty of that too. It's something I need to work on. We all we all can improve. Yeah. Mary just sends in a comment. says, thanks for your insights, Don. I want to ask, what are the best topics to connect people with when you carry on a small talk? That's a that's a wonderful question, and it's an important question. And you you have a choice, and this is this is part of the listening skill. It, when you're listening, you, you first of all you want to get other people to share some information about themselves. You want to have information that you can share too, so people know what you want to talk about. This is key because people will be afraid to ask you a question if they don't have any hints about what you want to talk about. So when you're listening to what other people are saying. They're going to give you an array, hopefully, of, of topics that you might be able to connect or have an interest in. So choose the ones that seem to be appealing to you. A caveat would be to avoid certain topics. And again, this, the situation uh, is important to consider where you are, with whom you're talking. There are certain topics that you really want to avoid, even though some people are really eager to talk about them. And in social situations uh, and in pro uh, professional situations, I strongly urge you not to talk about politics and sex and religion, even though they're important topics to us. But because they can be so uh, polarizing, you don't want to start your conversation in a way that is going to be in an in a adversarial. You might get to that point and have differences of opinion, and that's fine. But when you're choosing topics for small talk, start with things that are easy to talk about and, and fun to talk about, or at least um, give the person an opportunity to share a little bit about themselves and what, what is important to them uh, and go from there. The book is How to Start a Conversation and Make Friends. It's available now, right now below in the carousel. So check it out. Purchase the book. It's available on paperback, hardback, digital format. Is it, is it available on audio as well? Yes, Don? it is. Audio. So and, any and format video. you need, the book is in fact available. How do you differentiate between small talk, someone you just met, where it's easy to keep things light and avoid politics and that sort of thing, versus small talk with, let's say, relatives, let's say people you come in contact with Frequently. Now, I happen to have moved down to Florida, and I notice that there are certain friends of mine I know through my daughter's school, things like that, where I would say 98% of the time, if I see someone who looks like me, shall we say, in my age or even within 20 years, that person has political views that are completely the opposite of mine and happens to support people. And we're not going to mention political politicians' <laughs> names today, right. but they happen to mention people that I think are <laughs> less than desirable. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and quite often they will just say things assuming I feel exactly the same way. So it, it puts me in a dilemma. Do I just grit my teeth? and make them assume that I have their same political beliefs? Do I interject something and then have things spiral into a heated, hated conversation? Because that's happened occasionally where they're, they're spewing and screaming at me and then you can't ever talk to them again. Mm -hmm. How do you recommend handling a small talk situation like that? This is a, an important part of connecting with people. Uh, if you connect with people in an adversarial way, However you connect with people, this is my belief, however you initially connect with people is usually the way it's going to go. Right? And 
Now, maybe that's a very broad stroke, but I, and I'm speaking in general terms. But if you think back, you know, I I met this guy. Ah, I didn't like him. Or I met somebody. Gosh, she was really, I, I liked her. She, whatever it was. So this is just kind of a human nature thing. To answer your question, uh, it happens to me too. It happens to everyone. And in a new, what you describe is something that I think is really critical. You move to a new city. You're establishing new relationships with people that um, maybe share some kind of uh, commonality, a school or, or a neighborhood or whatever it might be. And I think the most important thing is to establish familiarity and say, hello, how are you? Now, this sounds really basic, but a lot of people won't do it. I live in Brooklyn, New York, and people have some types of attitudes about Brooklyn, like, yeah, you know, nobody. But I found that whenever somebody walks by where I live and I'm tending my garden, there's a key word for you, uh, uh, that I say hello because I want them to meet, see me as a familiar face. Then if we stop and have a conversation and we have some small talk, I can, get a, again, pick out some of those things. Now, if somebody says something to me that I find objectionable, that being, and that could be anything. It could be in politics or throwing your tomatoes are horrible. Yeah. yeah you're, you're See, kidding. I listen to the fact that you garden. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I really tend to avoid those, at least in the beginning. Yeah, you got to kind of grin, grin and bear it. But what happens when people throw those kind of comments out? You have to look between the lines. What, what's really going on there? One is they want to find out where you're at. So they're baiting. They're throwing out. It's like going fishing. They're throwing out some bait. And if you bite at it, you're hooked. And, and some people like to get into the argument. That's that's their nature. And when you talk, you asked about relatives and small talk. Well, this is number one. And I use I've seen it in my family. When my, you know, I won't go into the details, but you know, the 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 relative says, Well, don't you think that? And the reality the reality is, is well, no, I really don't think that. But as soon as you bite on that you're hooked and that's when you know the adversarial type person and there are people out there that's exactly what they're looking for so my answer to your question is to avoid taking the bait and, and try and find something now you can always say well you know what i don't quite agree with that but there's something else i'd really like to to ask you about and sometimes you just have to say look why don't we just agree to disagree on this and and uh remember when you were telling me about uh, something else that's referring to a topic that you heard earlier, a small talk topic that you didn't get a chance to talk about. That's how you change topics and get away from those adversarial uh, type of mm -hmm. topics, at least in the beginning of a relationship. Don, I could talk to you all day long. It's almost <laughs> as if you were great at yeah, how to start conversations. That's fantastic. We have a question coming in from one of our viewers. VL says, they say 90% of communication is physical. What's your reaction to that? Uh, that well, that's the reference to body language. And and that's an old statistic. And it's, it's probably pretty close to being true. Um, in the real world. Now we're in a, a virtual world and we're still having body language here. And I know, of course, as you're a professional uh, consultant and media uh, trainer, that you know the value and the, and the importance of, of body language. But body language alone cannot convey everything that we really want to. And, and people who believe that body language has all the answers are, are missing the boat. There's Tone of voice. So if you're talking like this, like this, and again, the public speaking is is this is all part of that. Um, you're going to lose whatever body language, positive body language, you're going to communicate, and also the the actual words that you use. So I look at it as total communication, and mm -hmm. I put a pie graph. And so I'll give 75, 80 percent to body language, 20 to 15% to the tone of voice and 5%, not saying that they're not important to words, but people take that whole picture in and, and, and absorb it. One last point about body language. If it's positive body language and good body language, in other words, you know, you're leaning forward, you have good eye contact, your arms aren't folded like this and some other negative type of body language, then your, your body language is going to reinforce 
what your 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 tone of voice and the words you're using. But if it's different, then there's going to be a, a I hate to use this word, but a disconnect between mm -hmm. the signals that you're sending physically, non-verbally, and the ones you're sending verbally. And this is where people get confused. They they misunderstand and the communication breaks down. Great insight. And I would just add that there was a study in 1969 by a professor of Moravia at UCLA purporting to show that 93% of communication yeah. was your body language and your voice, only 7% yeah. Yeah. your content. But <laughs> if you actually look beyond the headline, he was only testing when you're communicating emotion. Because obviously, if I speak to you in Mandarin and I've got great body language for the next hour, but you don't speak Mandarin, the fact that I have good body language and you like my voice will not help me communicate anything. You will understand zero. Precisely. So what his study really showed is if there's a disconnect between the emotion you're saying and your body language, people will remember the body language. So if I say mm -hmm. to someone, oh, yeah. <laughs> I really love you. You're fantastic. <laughs> That's really interesting. The body language and the voice is what people will remember. They'll, re they'll, they'll remember, oh, TJ hates me. Yeah. So that's what it is. So that's a huge, huge element of confusion. Yeah, I think it's a, 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 an excellent point to bring out. Uh, yeah. And it's important, but they've got to be synchronized for the best exactly. result. Yeah. The book is How to Start a Conversation and Make Friends, which is a, a true juggernaut in the publishing world. You've been through many, many different uh, versions of it, updates, formats. It's a huge, huge success. If you want to improve your ability <clears throat> to have small talk, check out the book. It's in the carousel below. If you're watching us on Amazon Live right now, you can click it. And I can tell you, I bought the book with my own money. I've read it. I've underlined it. I've referenced. It is quite useful. Don, it seems like so many people are held back from, oh, if I start talking to this person, I may say something stupid. And it does. It's happened to me. <laughs> but I would argue, that, and I think you do it, the pros outweigh the negatives. But tell us, you told us about the time someone said you weren't a good listener. But can you think of a time where you were truly embarrassed in small talk. I still remember it's more than 30 years ago. Okay. I was living in South Beach in Miami during its heyday. My mother happened to be visiting. We're sitting at the beach and there was a neighbor of mine that I'd spoken to yeah, three, four times before. Friendly. She happened to be, and I, I apologize if this sounds uh, inappropriate in any way. She happened to be perhaps the most stunningly beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life. I don't think that we were on a beach. It happened to be the section of the beach where women were topless. Not casting. If you want to cast judgments on that, that's just the way it was. So she sits right in front of me, between me and the beach, about 15 feet of front of me and my mother. So I'm a, you know, I won't say a young man, but a relatively younger man at the time. Uh, this was quite a startling Excuse me one second. I've gone out of focus. I've got to occasionally change camera angles because my autofocus can get messed up. So I, you know, I don't want to be inappropriate. I don't want to make her uncomfortable. <laughs> Excuse me one second. I'm actually going to have to turn off that camera angle, uh, that camera on camera three in our studio. Uh, because some every once in a while, the autofocus gets messed up. And I have to just turn it off. So I see her. I don't want to seem like, you know, some weird puppy dog or something. So <laughs> I see her. I don't do anything. I roll over. I read a book for 10 minutes. I walk down the beach. I'm coming back and I'm trying to be Mr. Casual. I'm like, oh, hi, Marianne. How are you today? It's a beautiful day, isn't it? She looks up at me and says, pardon me, I don't want to be bothered today. Could you please go away? So I'm, like, <laughs> I'm going back to my towel, and my mother says, well, you're really popular around here, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but 
But I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, time. But I, I do still remember it. It is human nature yeah, yeah. to remember the bad experiences more than just the mildly pleasant that lead to other things. Has anything like that ever happened to you? Uh, yeah, it's funny as you were describing it. I was thinking, well, geez, that sounds like a pretty good situation to be in, at least initially, you know, minus Ma there. But uh, <laughs> leave it to mothers to tell it like it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, what, what that reminded me of was I was on a flight going somewhere, uh, and I, I liked to talk to people, you know, sitting in the seat next to me, just not jabbering, but just, hi, how are you this morning? Um, where, you know, are you off to business or pleasure? You know, a very, very light kind of thing. No agenda per se. And so I, I kind of opened up the conversation with this woman who's sitting next to me. And she turns to me and says, I don't talk to people on airplanes. I mean, just how that woman talked to you. She wasn't topless, by the way. Just, just to <laughs> clarify, okay. I just, I just want to make it clear. And I want to clarify. I do talk to people who are not topless. So. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's just that's so good. Could it be, you know, even, even tempered this way? Yeah. So I said, oh, okay. Excuse me, you know, lady. I just happened to be sitting next to you, and I just thought I'd say, you know, welcome to the flight. Um, okay. Fast forward that the the flight attendant is bringing. This was one of the in the. This shows you how long ago this was. This is the days when they actually brought you food onto the plane. You know the the, the airline uh, flight attendants, and I had ordered, I don't know, a vegetarian meal because I wasn't crazy about the you know the airline food at that time. So they brought me this pretty nice looking little dish of food, and all of a sudden the the woman she all of a sudden perks up because they had brought her this piece of whatever it was that looks ah, and. And she turns to me and she says, oh, my goodness, how did you get to get that, you know, order to get them to bring you that, such a beautiful, you know, little dish of food? So being the type of person that I am, <laughs> I'm licking my chops here. I turned to her and I said, I'm sorry, but I don't speak to people on airplanes. <laughs> And then I just started laughing and I said, well, nah, nah, nah. so, you know, it, sometimes people will just, they send the wrong signal. I mean, Wait, did she talk to you after that or did that? We, we, stifle we had a little, yes. I, 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 I only pretended, you know, to kind of point out that, you know, she didn't have to do that. Yeah. You know? I mean, she didn't, if, if somebody doesn't want to talk, you can say, look, excuse me, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right in the middle of this book and I cannot stop. Or, you know, excuse me, um, I'd love to chat, but I really need to, to take this time to take a nap. You, you can do, you can, you can stop the interaction in a tactful way. And this is, you know what? It's nothing more than good manners. That's all it is. It's not being, you know, assertive, although it is being assertive, because you don't want to have your ear chewed off if you really need to do something else. But it, it, it really kind of comes down to just some basic good manners. And I'm not going like, to miss manners. I think her books are terrific, by the way. Um, but just a little bit of respect. People do this, just to wrap this point up, because they're uncomfortable interacting with people that they don't know. And this is one of the things where small talk has such an important role to play because it helps bridge that discomfort gap if it's done the right way. And that's why initially when I'm talking to people like where you were in the, in your neighborhood with the, um, the, the person who was, you know, maybe at the school or wherever it was, um, you want to establish a very neutral, friendly, overriding um, uh, presence so that when you do have a, a few extra minutes to chat, maybe you're on the corner or you're waiting for somebody or something, that it's not like, oh, God, what's this person going to be like? Are they uh, are they friend or foe? So, But that was my, uh, hey, I don't talk to people on airplanes. 
<laughs> but here, you want some of my meal? <laughs> <laughs> How to start a conversation. It's a perennial bestseller. It's available now on Amazon. It's in the carousel below. You can click on it right now. More questions coming in. This from Zhao. How do you react to the person who tries to put you down or overpower you when you communicate with them? Yeah, yeah. There are those people out there. They're, they're conversational bullies. Um, they're again, reading between the lines. What, what, what is their intent? Now I'm not a therapist and I'm not a psychologist, so I don't try to unravel those motivations in people because I'm not skilled to do that. But what I will say is that people who are overly aggressive in, in their communication style are really, you know, their goal is to, is to, dominate the time and they think that by being oh i'm in this and, and maybe you know being a little bit too um forceful or bragging a little bit too much about all their um accomplishments and things their their objective is to rise above the other person and that's the same objective that they have by saying oh oh you wrote the book about small talk <laughs> I didn't learn a thing about that because I really know all about it. And here, mm -hmm. let me tell you, I, I, you know, and then pretty soon, you know, so you see really where that's at. So the question is, is what do you do about that? Once again, you have a choice. You can take the bait because a lot of times that's exactly what it is. They're, they're throwing out a piece of bait and they're hoping that you're going to take a bite out of it. And that now that you're in a, a pitched battle, a conversation battle where they really have, the opportunity to show how smart and how dominant they are. Or mm -hmm. you can say, well, you know, I guess there are a lot of people who know what to do. I'm not sure you're one of them, but <laughs> so you can show a little bit of sarcasm, yeah. which can lead to some other conversations. You're not going to win a lot of points that way. Or you can say, hey, look, everyone, even people like you are entitled to, hit, you know, your, their opinions. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of, my advice to you is sidestep them because mm -hmm. you can't win. It, it's just a no win situation. Depending, you may see these person, this person at work. You may see this person in your neighborhood. You may not have an opportunity to sidestep them all the time. Sometimes you may never see the person again. So you have to, again, use your judgment on how to, uh, how to, um, address the situation. It's not one size fits all. That's a big mistake. So uh, if somebody puts you down, the, the best thing you can say, if you really want to be honest and direct, and there's nothing wrong with that, it says, you know what, I really don't appreciate that. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. let's, let's, let me tell you how I, that's how I feel about it. And mm -hmm. sometimes the person go, oh, oh, really? Well, I didn't, I was just joking. See, and so that's another defense mechanism. They, they don't understand the art of tact. And, and so they, and this is not new for them because they're stepping in, you know what, all the time, but people sometimes call them on it and sometimes they don't. So, you know, use your discretion. If it's a family member, I think you can say, hey, look, you know what, I, I really don't appreciate that comment. You know, sometimes family members will talk about your friends or another friend will talk about a friend. Say, look, you know, these are my friends. And, I, you know, if you don't like them, that's your business. But I don't appreciate hearing that kind mm -hmm. of stuff from you about them. That's a fair statement. The chips will fall where they may, yeah. but it's okay. Don, are there ever times when you feel, hang on one second. I just, I've got to switch camera angles because I'm having a focus problem. That was are there ever times... When you're an internationally renowned small talk expert, are there ever times when you feel like you're out of your comfort zone? I mean, I'm, I would say I'm more outgoing than most people, but there are times when I think I'm somewhat shy. I remember it was two years into the pandemic. I hadn't talked to that many people other than my family in a while. I went to the South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, and I went by myself and all of a sudden I see tons and tons of pods and clusters of people yeah. in their mid twenties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I felt a little awkward about just going up and talking. And 
I was about to turn 60. I'm about to turn 62 this year. It just seemed a little awkward. A part of me is thinking, they're thinking, who's this old guy here? Why does he want to talk to us? Have you ever felt out of your comfort zone and maybe pulled back on starting small talk? I think everyone has that feeling at one time or another. This is just human nature. You know, we, we, we look for situations that reinforce who we are and, and who, who we want to connect with. Now you describe a networking situation and what you, the, the situation that you described is one of the questions that I'm most frequently asked is how do you join a conversation that's with people that you don't know that, you know, the, the people are already talking and it could be in a, a party environment or a professional environment <clears throat> uh, or in the, in your neighborhood. And it's the first thing I do is I'm not one of these people that just, you know, charge in. I mean, I'm outgoing like you are TJ, but when I walk into a room that I don't know and I'm not familiar with, the first thing I do is I look around the room. I, 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 I scope the room out. And what am I, what am I looking for? I'm looking for people who I think are sending, there's where body language becomes very important because I can't hear what they're saying. I don't have any words, but I'm looking at their body language. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking not, I'm looking for a guy like you right now and I'm going the other way, see? So, uh -huh. <laughs> but now I'm looking for a guy who looks like you and I'm heading towards you. So, so mm -hmm. that's the first thing. You wanna go where you have the greatest likelihood of success. So if you, this group of, of people at the South by Southwest conference, they were all, you know, half your age, and they all have all kinds of adornments of which you have none versus some other people who maybe look a little bit closer to people who you think might be more approachable, and that's the key word, then that's where you go first. I don't encourage you to go to people who you think are going to be the hardest people to talk to. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is this. You you know, you have to go up and you, and and be within listening distance to hear what they're saying, show good eye contact. So you're not right there yet, but you're maybe just within five to seven feet away. Establish eye contact with the speaker because now that shows that you're listening, you're hearing what this guy's saying. Smile, there's your body language. And pretty soon the person's establishing eye contact with you. And that's your signal that you can move towards that, that cluster looking for an opening. Here's what happens after that then you know you want to at, you don't want to say hey well i have the same thing you want to maybe ask a few questions just integrate into the conversation quickly with a question but here's what happens overall other people see you communicate this way they see here's this guy who i don't know i don't know who he is and i see him now he's communicating with some other people who i may know one or two people he looks like he's probably pretty easy to talk to so then when the opportunity comes to talk to this other person, maybe in this other group, you're a little, your entity is a little, they're aware a little bit. Now they may or may not be aware, but this is how I answer that question. And this is how I do it. I don't just go barge in and say, Hey, you know, I'm the guy who wrote the book about small talk, you know, so you better listen to me. But small talk and networking, this are like this. And that's mm -hmm. the other benefit of small talk is that ability to connect in a professional environment quickly and effectively with some kind of, hopefully some kind of result. Our guest is the internationally renowned expert on small talk, Don Gabor. He's published a dozen books, multiple languages, and has taught people in workshops, training seminars, cons consultations around the globe. We're so happy. He's our guest today. The book is available in the carousel, How to Start a Conversation. Don, you're there in Brooklyn, in New York City. Celebrities are there everywhere. They live there. Any special advice for talking to a celebrity? Because there's so, sometimes the, the hesitancy, like everyone's going to go up and bother. They might just be standing there alone. <clears throat> I just say something that doesn't seem trite. Oh, I'm your biggest fan. Hey, you're bothering me. What do you personally do if you meet a celebrity? Well, you know, there's an old saying, that what's worse than uh, being talked about, not being talked about. Yeah. And so I think 
here in New York, there are celebrities around. I mean, there's 10 million people here. So, you know, there, there's a few celebrities, but most people are not. But to answer your question, here in Brooklyn, there are, you know, people that you will see in the media. And I, I have seen, you know, Tony Bennett at a club. I went over to him and, and I did say, you know what, I, I just want to let you know, I, I really enjoy your music. I don't, if somebody comes up to me and I'm not a celebrity and I don't even consider myself even anything like that. But maybe somebody has read one of my books or on this, somebody in the neighborhood knows me. If they say something to me, I, I take it as a compliment. If they're trying to pick my brain and something like that, I, I take that as a compliment too, up to a point. So I, I don't think you want to gush and be over, you know, I have your autograph. Some people love that. Some celebrities love it. Some don't. Um, I kind of am of the... If I see a celebrity that I know, I might smile and say hello. I don't ask people for their autographs. And if I see somebody who I can genuinely say, I really, I love your performance in, uh, you know, some film, I, I think that's okay. And I think they will, the person would take it as a compliment. And let's face it, if you're in the public eye, in most cases, Compliments are welcome. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. Following up on your comments, the previous question about asking questions, I agree with you completely. Ask questions because it makes people feel like you're interested in it. But how many is too many? I remember once, it was probably 20 years ago, I was at some club promotional event in, in a midtown Manhattan. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was right across from the Flatiron building. I think it was a 50 cents club or something. And I just started talking to someone. I had no idea who she was, but she happened, I found out later, she happened to be a very famous professional wrestler. <laughs> so I'm talking to her and she seemed very friendly and we're talking and I'm thinking, this is a fantastic conversation. And the next, and she was telling me, oh, I'm a professional wrestler. Well, I don't meet professional wrestlers every day. Although I did grow up in Charlotte, North Carolina and Ric Flair and all those people are all around there, but still, you know, I hadn't met a professional wrestler in 40 years. So I'm asking a few questions. I'm thinking, wow, this is a fantastic conversation. And she says, ah, this starts, this is starting to feel like an interview. And she walked away. <laughs> so clearly I did something wrong. <laughs> yeah. What's your advice on how many questions versus then trying to add into the conversation? Well, let, let me just preface it with this. If I met a professional wrestler, like you described, the first thing I would say was, want to arm wrestle? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> uh, here, here's, here's, here's the pitfall that you fell into. When asking questions, and there are certain professions that tend to do this, uh, asking too many questions begins to sound like an interview. And who, who, who asks questions for a living? Well, people in the media because that's what they do. Uh, attorneys, because that's what they do. Law enforcement, because that's what they do. And there are some others that would fall into that. And there's other professions that fall into other um, conversational quicksand. Let's just put it that way. So I go back to my original, one of my original points in the three points was to balance talking and listening. So Remember, if people want to talk to you, they, they want to know what you want to talk about. By just asking questions, you're showing interest. But if you're asking too many short, in, uh, closed ended yes or no questions, that's the interview. That's what, or, you know, a few open ended questions. You know, how did you get into this? That's one of the open ended questions you asked me in the beginning of this interview. Now, that's a great question. It got me talking, and I said all kinds of things that you could pull out. New York and uh, adult ed learning and so on. So it gives you an opportunity to know more of what I want to talk about. So the pitfall that you fell into with this woman, and it, she may have just been oversensitive to it, but she, she could have handled it in a much better way. She could have said, enough about me. What do you think of my muscles? No, she would say, mm -hmm. you could say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, th I'm glad that you're so interested in wrestling, but I, I kind of like to find out a little bit more about you that would have solved a big problem. Yeah. So once again, 
these are these skill sets that they seem small, you know, and that's why I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that, you know, big things happen when you do the little things right. And, mm -hmm. and they can make such a difference in the outcome. So the outcome of your conversation with this woman wrestler was negative in, in the sense that she thought, well, you're nothing but a, you know, mm -hmm. where's your, your, Nope. You know, I, I do need to be careful here. I should let people know. I do talk to men and other people too. Certainly, <laughs> <laughs> someone walking oh, around DJ, talking to women all on. the time, <laughs> and especially since I've been married for the last dozen years too. Yeah, so I, yeah. I do want to make that clarification. <laughs> Just to clarify, it's okay. Yeah. Hey, Don. Here's the, the the trouble I have, and I think it relates to you too with your clients is people come to me all the time and they say, well, TJ, basically I can't be a good public speaker because I'm an introvert. If someone <laughs> tells you, well, I can't be good at small talk. I'm an introvert. And that if you start to give a label like that to yourself, and then you tell yourself, and I don't like small talk, you put oh, those yeah. two together and it's a very negative spiral. I, we don't talk about politics here, but there's a very famous politician who ran for president this year, who's a governor of a major Southern state that I happen to live in, who on paper was a perfect presidential candidate, young, energetic, raised tons of money, great at the ballot box, had won re-election, but it became quite apparent as he was running for president he was horrible at small talk. He would fly to a fundraiser. People would have spent weeks and weeks and weeks calling everyone they know to raise $2 million. And he wouldn't talk to them at the reception. <laughs> he wouldn't have conversations. And his, according to his staff, hates small talk, thinks he's, I don't know if he thinks he's too good or insecure or something. Yeah. How do you help people get over that? Because it, in this particular case, it's yeah. what I can't, you can never say in politics, something is the single most decisive element, but it's certainly seen widely that one of the main detriments to his campaign was his inability to engage in small talk. Yeah. Well, just to put an exclamation point on that, whether you're a, you know, whatever your political affiliation is, when Bill Clinton went into a room, he could make anybody he was talking to feel like the most important person in the room. And that was because he had that ability to connect with people in a, in a, in a variety of formats. And I think, you know, there's other politicians that were very good at that too. So what I tell people who think that, well, first of all, that they're introverts and extroverts, and, and there are different communication styles and there are different, you know, to some people that are more outgoing and, and some people that are less outgoing. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's nature. The problem is that if you think that your nature justifies not focusing on a critical element of communication, then you're doing yourself a disservice. And that's, I can't put it in a more direct way. People who say small talk isn't important, they couldn't be more incorrect. Now, I've done lots of presentations to engineering groups. Now, I'm not an engineer. I'm a son of an engineer. So Me I know <laughs> I know what this, and I used to use that little line when I talked to engineers and they'd always sit there going, oh, what's this guy going to tell me that I don't know? And I'd say, how many engineers, you know, you're all engineers. How many engineers are right most of the time? I'd say, oh, I'm right by the time. How many engineers, you know, hate being wrong? I hate being wrong. How many engineers are good at small talk? <laughs> Nobody raised that. I said, that's why I'm here. You know, yeah. so I try to communicate to people who feel this way that it's their attitude about it that is doing only disservice to them and to the people with whom they have an opportunity to connect with, not just for the, for the benefit of others. And this is something that I really impress or I try to impress upon people. It's just not about you and how much you can benefit. I like to talk to people, not only to learn stuff about me, about, about my, what I can do to improve whatever it is or find a new um, musical instrument that I'm interested in or gardening or whatever it might be, but I'm interested in finding out how I might be able to help that other person accomplish his or her goals. 
Now that's my nature. Okay. I, and I, I don't think that everybody has that nature, but people who think small talk isn't important. It, it, it's, it's, it's incorrect because it establishes a quick line, a, a quick connection to people. Two, it gives you the opportunity to exchange information quickly to find out what, where you have some commonality so that you can then build some kind of a bridge. That bridge can lead to a more, uh, a longer or a, a more fruitful relationship. That's what mm -hmm. networking is about. That's what friendship is about. That's what Which I should point out is, is why we're here. Some authors yeah. get placed on talk shows and podcasts like this because they write a check for $10,000 to a PR firm. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're in fact here because you engaged me in small talk 20 years ago. <laughs> it followed up the form of networking. We stayed connected. I yeah. became an admirer of your work. So that's, that is in fact why we're here. Yeah. That's a long-term relationship. I was very happy when I got the the message from you. I thought, wow, TJ, haven't talked to him in a long time. And I went and on, I did Googled you this morning and saw what you're doing and that you're still, you know, active in the in the speaking business and training business and the book writing business. And I thought, this is great. I love it when this happens. Great. And I appreciate what you just said. Part of small talk is listening to someone figure out, well, how can you do or say something to help them? So I want to do that right now. Typically, talk shows don't do that. It's seen as lazy, but I think we've done some good hard work here already. So I want to give you just 60 seconds. If 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 the Today Show came to you and said, hey, we're going to give you a 60 second ad to say whatever you want promoting your book. What do you want to say starting now? So I want to do that right now. Assuming some of our friends on Amazon may have just popped in. Maybe they missed earlier parts of the interview. Talk to us for you know, 30, 60 seconds about your book as if they hadn't heard any part of this conversation. If you think small talk isn't important in your personal life, your professional life, and your social life, then you're missing the boat. Small talk is the key to success in all three of those areas. Now, long ago, it all started for me by writing and teaching a workshop about how to start a conversation and make friends. And what I'd like to share with you in the next few moments are three really critical things to help you improve your ability to connect with people. Number one, don't be afraid to start the conversation. Be the first to say hello. It shows that you're friendly and open to communication. Second, share a little bit about yourself. Not too much, but share a little bit about yourself. It could be a, a t-shirt that says, you know, I love gardening, or it could be a musical instrument, a guitar. And then share a little bit about how you'd like to connect with somebody else. It's your interest in other people that will make the difference. If you're networking, use small talk to break into other groups and, and start your conversations with people. I guarantee you that if you use good communication skills, whether you're speaking in public in a workshop or in a large convention or in a one-to-one -one conversation, your life, your personal life, your professional life, and your social life will get a whole lot better. How to Start a Conversation. It's available right now in the carousel. Go ahead and click it and buy it. It could enhance your own life. You may have family members, friends. You may have a friend or a relative about to graduate from high school, and you're not completely sure they're the best networker and you want to help their career. This might be the perfect graduation there present. You go. How to Start a Conversation. Our special guest today has been Don Gabor, internationally renowned expert on the art of small talk. Thanks so much for joining us, Amazon Live. If you're watching this on demand, the links still work. Go ahead and get the book. I'll see you here next time. Okay, so Don, thanks. We're we're not done. If you've got a few more minutes, I'm, but we have I'm, ended I'm the we have ended the Amazon Live section. Okay. So those of you who want to see it or if you want to share it with anyone, you just mm -hmm. go to my Amazon storefront, which is amazon.com slash shop slash TJ Walker success. And we'll, we'll send that link and make it available to you later. Okay, great. Okay. Thank so you. Don, you're, I'm going to, I hope extract some extra value out of you. You're I, a small you know, talk expert. You're a conversation expert. How could our conversation have been better, better for, the viewers, prospective buyers, better for you. 
you know, it, it, it's tough. I, and by I, the way, this sure. will be seen. This will be seen as forgive me for interrupting. Yeah. This will be seen as sort of the out, you know, in a movie where they show the outtakes at the end after yeah. the credits yeah. are rolling. We're going to play the whole sort of official interview, yeah. but then we'll be playing this at the end, you know, uh -huh. interspersed <clears> any <throat> cuts that seem interesting. So how could this conversation have been more helpful to you and the audience? Do you, you know, I, I mean, I, I think you're asking for a critique. Is that, or you want yeah. my, my glib, my glib. And I know you don't want to rip me apart, but any, no, any no. suggestions on how to, to make seen, it better? I'll tell you what I really would have liked to have seen. I would have liked to have seen photographs of the, the, on the beach with your mother and, and, and the, uh, uh, you know, the well, I can show you the expression. The shut face. you down. Right. So yeah. that's the that expression would, on my I face, think, although I, I had more hair. Added audio visual would have really been striking there. Um, okay. And then, and then I, I would have also liked to have seen, you know, like, you know, you with the, with the, with the woman wrestler saying, well, I rescued this conversation by. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah. That, that would I, have I'm, been I'm much just, better. If know, only you'd been there whispering yeah. in my. No, I, in I my think ear. you are a, a wonderful host. And I, I knew that from, long ago and because I we'd done things way back here when you lived in New York and um I feel completely comfortable with you and mm -hmm. and I'm I'm I can't say that I've always felt that way about interviews that I've been on. I mean I'm a I've done a lot of them. You have to do what you have to do. I had one person uh, say if I said the book too many times she was gonna rip my lips off. Okay, <laughs> fine. I like my lips the way they are. You know, to do that. <laughs> you know? So no, I, I think you're terrific. And um as far as now, you bring up a good point because that references one of our our comments that came in earlier about always you know one of our viewers and community members said, refer to the book in all replies. That is the kind of thing that where for certain reporters and hosts, it puts them into a race. They can't stand it. Yeah. And here's the thing. They say they hate when all authors do that. What I have found is it's not that all authors do it. One out of 500 will do it, but it's, it's so memorable because it's so annoying. People forget the fact that 499 authors never even mention they have a book and quite often waste their well, media. That's true too. Yeah. 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 Well, my, my feeling about that TJ is um, once again, you've got to read the, you've got to read the audience and the audience in this case is the producer uh, of the show. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's always better. This is my view. It's always better. If somebody else blows the horn for the author. Uh, which I think I did a time or two. A, during you know, I have no complaints about you whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I know what the person who wrote that in is talking about. And yes, there is a point that if I've had to, at times, I was told, you know, I'm convinced the book, you know, two or three times. And I was, I had one host that was, I, I barely got a word in edgewise. I was, I was a prop. I wasn't a, I wasn't a guest. I was a prop. And it didn't take me long to figure that out. And I had to interrupt and say, oh, and by the way, my book, How to Start a Conversation and Make Friends, will help you, you know, and do that. So my advice to authors who, who want to promote their books through the media is to ask, is it okay, you know, if I mention the book a couple of times? And if the person says, absolutely, I will help you, just like what you said, hold up the book. I would have never done that if you hadn't said, Don pulled up the book. So you gave me permission. Um, if you overdo it, you'll, you'll, it's like putting too much salt in a dish. You'll mm -hmm. kill the dish and mm -hmm. you'll kill the interview. If by doing that too much, you'll never get invited back. The word gets around, producers know each other and um, it won't sell you more books. I can guarantee yeah. you. And I, I do think the most powerful use of the media is not any one interview. It's being so interesting that they invite you back and other shows invite you back and you get a regular presence. That's really the most powerful way of using the media rather than saying, I've got to put everything into this one interview and, and suck every sale out of this one interview. Yeah. It, can that's I, short -term can, I, can I say one, one thing? Uh, you asked me about 
if I could, what, what I could say that would make this sh the show better. And, and it's, it's a, it's a great question. And it would be a question that I would answer, uh, you know, in a more, in a slightly different environment. What happens is if somebody, and the reason I'm saying this is that sometimes people will ask for feedback and they, they, they say, well, what could I do better? And what I caution people, and I heard you say this in, before I came onto the show when you're talking about public speaking and giving criticism, that you want to find one thing that you think the person can do better or, or, and, and just focus on that. Because if you start to, well, you could have done this better and you could have done that better and this better and then all these- And your tie things. was ugly. And yeah, <laughs> and why, 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 what's going on with it? You know, it, 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 it saps all the joy out of whatever could have been there. Now, I had no real criticism of, of our interview. And believe me, I've been on interviews where if they'd asked me, I still would have said, oh, I enjoyed it very much. Now, sure. is that being honest or dishonest? It's being tactful and it's being smart. Off camera, if I said, you know, you know, it would have been helpful if X, Y, Z. Okay, that's fair enough. We're professionals and we can deal with that. So th that my point to, to the audience here is be careful if somebody says, you know, I, I got invited to some some uh, songwriting thing where I'm going to play my song and they're going to give me all feedback. I'm thinking, oh, no, 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 you don't, you don't want to do that because you're never going to write a song again if you do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so be careful if somebody asks you that. Just stick with the positive. Try and make and I, you know, I mean, I, mean, I was making jokes about the, the, the you know, the, the wrestler and the woman on the beach. Mm -hmm. But. Let me, I think it's let me ask a follow-up question on that because yeah. one one of my own goals, you know, trying to I've read a lot of books about interviewing lately because I've done thousands of interviews in my yeah. career, but I haven't really done that much in the last ten years. So I re recently read a lot of books and studied analysis of you know Joe Rogan and people who are yeah. successful, and a lot of them mention you need to reveal your own flaws, your own mistakes more to make the audience understand. And I see that it was it was memorable because you've referenced the stories. So that I was trying to do that. And I don't think I do that enough in the past. But is it is it too much? Because it relates to the other thing I was trying to improve, which is to listen more and talk less because just like someone told you once, I've been told I talk too much, I interrupt. And I want this to be a place where word gets around. If you're interviewed on this show, it's a place where you are respected and you get to really air your thoughts. And it's not a place where the host talks over you. So those were the two areas where I was tr consciously trying to improve, sharing more of my own vulnerability, mistakes, flaws, and listening and not interrupting as much. I think it's great. I think you did a, it was a nice balance balance. Um, I, I, you know, if it goes on too much, then you know, it, look, this is how I see stuff. Every, everything has to be balanced in a certain way. It doesn't have to be exactly like this, but it's got to have an ebb and flow of, of topics and, and feelings. And, and if you go too far in any one direction, it's going to tilt. And what's going to happen is the listener or the other person or people that you're interacting with, are going to feel a little discomfort. People are not going to be comfortable if somebody in a conversation starts to reveal too much. Well, I got this and this and this. And priest is like, oh God, get me out of here, will you? But I think when you talked about, you know, the some of the conversations that went bad or went south, it shows who you are. And, if, and it was interesting because I was thinking what would be really a great topic for professional speakers wasn't to talk about, oh, I talked in front of 5,000 people and it was great and I loved it. I'd like to hear all the, the, the ones that went wrong because they're funny usually at somebody else's, at the speaker's mm -hmm. expense. Okay, fair enough. Mom, I fell that. off a stage once. By yeah, the way. <laughs> see, so this happened. And so what that shows is that this happens to everyone, even professionals who do this every day or however often they do it. Um, but you don't want to hear one after the other. You want to hear, yeah. you know, some of the successes. And and for me, the successes in conversation are um, that I've learned a lot about things that I would never have experienced myself. I'm never going to jump out of an airplane with a parachute or not a parachute, for certainly not a parachute. But it's fun talk, talking to people 
a, a fellow who I just met uh, a little while ago who did that because that was on his bucket list. But he told me it was on his bucket list because he was just had recovered from cancer. So mm -hmm. there was a, you know, it's a combination of things. Now, if he told me about his cancer, okay, I, I could, I could feel horrible and sat and, and sympathize with the situation, but because he told me about a related event, it changed the whole tenor of the conversation. So that's what I mean by balance. So what you did, I love the wrestler. And the <laughs> moment on the beach was a I thought either. about that in a long, <laughs> long pictures, time. Pictures, pictures, pictures. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember who it was. Again, I didn't follow wrestler, but it was yeah. apparently someone put a little, put a little, who was one of the three most famous women wrestlers in put, the world. Put a little in thing over her 2006 eyes. <laughs> or something like that. So it, it was a while. Let's turn the tables. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, I, I guess what I, I, I'm trying to get across, maybe in an indirect way, is you got to have a little. You got to have fun with yeah. this. There's a lot of there's a lot of laughs that you can have when you're talking to people, when you find out what tickles their funny bone, quote unquote, and, and some of these things that, you know, the, maybe the speaking things that went wrong, and I've had several of those myself too, uh, you know, you, you can get a laugh out of it. And, and that's part of the connecting. And, and where people, they want to be around people who are, are a little more fun to be with. I mean, let's just put it that way. So don't be afraid to share some of those vulnerabilities if they lead to something that people can at least enjoy a little bit, not, not you know, I, I like, got to okay, follow up on that. I know your time is valuable. I got to let you go at some point, but you just brought up a, such an important point. People like to be around people who are fun. And one of the things I've noticed about you when we are in the same room, you have a nice smile on your face. And one of the things that you see all the time from people who say they're shy, say they're introverted is they walk into a room and their face is blank and it looks like a, you know, a scowl or a frown. Mm -hmm. How much of being good at small talk is just having a little bit of a smile on your face? You, you mentioned Bill Clinton earlier. I mean, it's one of the things he's known for is he's always got a smile on his face. Not me. No, no, I don't smile. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nature, you know, again, mm -hmm. it's, it's people, pick up who you are visually first. They see your body language before you communicate anything else. And all I can say is, and I know people who do, do exactly as you were describing, they walk in there, I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna talk to anybody. I don't want anybody to talk to me. And you know what? Nobody does talk to them mm -hmm. and they don't wanna be there because nobody talks to them because they don't think it's important. And they're losing out. It's so, a self-reinforcing yeah, I mean, cycle. And, and, and of negativity, you know, it, it, it's just, a, it's, it doesn't have to be that way. And you don't have to change your personality. I don't think we can change our personality, but you can change your behavior to, to reflect <clears throat> a little bit more openness. That's all I am encouraging people to do who, who feel that way is just send some signals that you are willing to communicate. If you're, if you can't do that, then you're just shutting the door. And it's not just shutting the door to one individual. It's shutting the door to a professional uh, road, to a social road, and to a personal road. You just don't know who you're going to talk to. You never know. And it may lead to something. It may not. It may help you. You may help the other person. It may not go anywhere. But you can have at least that practice of interacting with people. And this is one of the big messages that I want to get across to people. You can practice these skills every single day, whenever you're in view of people. So people walking by where you live, you don't have to say hello if you don't, but you can smile. But if you're like this, forget it. Yeah. It's no. And Gabor, the okay. road for you is always open at the tj walker success that's great i, I love to hear that the when the door is always open that's thank beautiful. you so much for being our guest today i, mean, okay. I, I was thrilled so, to be on your show that's our sort of our last hard close i i don't want to take any more of your valuable time I'm, I'm <clears throat> what i am going to do right now is i'm going to do a series of three or four ads for your book and i'm going to do it live i share it with people here you don't need to stay, but if you want to, you're more than welcome I'm, I'm, to. Look, I like to if see you, you work. 
if you want to see it. So what I do is I just have a tripod right here. Wow, look at that. With a, they call it a gooseneck. And I've got my cell phone. That's pretty cool. I have put in a, a receiver to make the audio quality a little better. I'm going to put it close to my camera so that the people who are still with us on our live stream can see it. So I, I just open up the camera app. I have the forward facing one <clears throat> on me. I'm going to change my pocket square. Uh, you may be, you, I don't know if you ever watched Dallas cliff Barnes was the, was the evil villain. He always had his pocket square out like this much. <laughs> so I always feel like I'm the villain on Dallas when my pocket square sticks out. So I'm going to try to make that a little neater and less obtrusive. So <clears throat> again, what, what Amazon does is they have this program for influencers where you can just make a video of a simple video. Some people get very fancy and do editing and add all sorts of production values. I just do very simple talking head videos and I'm not making some fortune, but you know, in a typical month, there's 10,000 views of my videos, oh, several hundred sales. And I get a little money. Is it is it enough to buy lunch on a typical day? No, but <laughs> it sort of gets me into the game because I have people. So many people over the years say, "TJ, I want to speak more. I like to make more money." And as you know, you can wait a long time waiting for the conference organizer who also hired Anthony Robbins for a hundred thousand to hire you. You can wait a long time before Pepsi or Coca-Cola says, hey, take a meeting with us. We want to talk about sponsoring you. Yeah. So there's these two big hurdles, these two big gatekeepers for most people is how do you get in front of more people and how do you get a relationship with some sort of company where you could possibly make money? And then the third thing for people who just want to start off as traditional influencers is if you're not famous like Kim Kardashian and have 300 million followers, how do you get in front of anyone to sell? Yeah. So what Amazon does is they say, if you have a thousand followers on a major social media platform, typically they let you in and then you can make an ad for any product for sale on Amazon. Wow, if someone watches the video and then buys the product, they give you a credit and you get a little affiliate yeah, commission. Peace. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing as an experiment for the last three and a half months. It's sort of a, I'm showing people my own journey in this platform and with the idea of inspiring more people to be creators and to look for ways of speaking. So I'm going to hold. So I have a question for you. Yes. Um, when you do this for uh, a particular product, have they approached you to say, uh, TJ, I want you to, I want you to hold up this, this bottle of, uh, of th this vacuum cleaner that, that cleans out. The I have, I, I have recently started have people from other products who've seen ads say, Hey, will you do our product? And then they, and you say, okay, or is this something that you do? You see a product that you happen to like, and you say, look, I, I, I made this, um, would you like to use this on your website? How, can you just give me a quick? Well, idea there's you, there's a lot of different aspects of this. There's there are people who their entire business model is creating user generated video, not for Amazon. They just do a video about why they like a product, and then they mm -hmm. contact the company and say, "Hey, if you want, if you like my video, I'll sell it to you for uh, two hundred bucks or one hundred and fifty bucks." Yeah. And there are uh -huh. people who it's all they do; they turn out twenty videos a day. Yeah, well. and they're making 75 bucks each then, and then they've made almost a couple thousand dollars. So there, that's a business model. Another business model is being just an Amazon influencer where you get tiny commissions, but Walmart has programs. Target has programs, YouTube, TikTok, they all have programs. It's hard for most people to make much money until you have a bigger following. 
Yeah, right. But there it's are people who make six figure incomes from what I've seen through the Amazon influencer program where they're really putting in a tremendous amount of time yeah. being highly selective in their pro. I only do products that I just have already bought things in my house, books that I like. I don't really stop to think about how much money I'm going to make from it because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to just essentially hone another communication art skill. Yeah, yeah, I pitch, can see that. Yeah. Doing an advertising. Okay, so I've, oh, I got to plug my microphone. Okay, I, I, I will not ask any more questions. Okay, I'm going to plug, and you're welcome to stay on because this is not what, what you see on the screen is not what will be on Amazon. I'm recording this through a separate camera of my cell phone. I'm now okay, going to so, sync. So what, what I'm syncing you're my to... microphone that oh. connects to my camera. Yeah, right. I saw you advertise that on the, the Sony. Uh... And also you may have noticed one of those ads, I clearly didn't have a microphone on. I was using the built in. So the, the volume went I, way I, down. It yeah, sounded yeah, much worse. That. Yeah. Yeah, the and I made a note to myself, hey, I probably shouldn't run that one. It's not very impressive. Yeah. Now, the other thing I'm noticing, and this is a show on this channel here where uh, the you know part of the premise is I'm taking people behind the curtains <laughs> so they see what really goes on as a content creator. So I can tell right now I'm getting shiny. I'm actually going to put some more powder on, not to make myself look a thousand times better looking, but I'm noticing a shine yeah. on my face. And <clears throat> for some reason, my, oh, there it is. The brush fell on the floor. <laughs> so I'm not trying to be perfect, but if I'm trying to convince people yeah. that I can make you look confident, comfortable, and relaxed, I don't want to seem like I'm sweaty and nervous. No, so I'm just these, are, put, these are all the professional things that, you know, you if you're gonna do I'm just putting a light mosaic powder on. Yeah, I wish I had some of that. <laughs> Any drugstore will have that. You just want a mosaic powder that doesn't make your skin look darker or lighter than it does. Mm. You don't want to have a like a tan line or something. Uh, you can do anything about this gray hair here. I mean Hey, you... I'll I'll swap you in a moment. <laughs> you got a lot more than I do. I, it's it's a lot easier to change a color than to get some. Believe me. <laughs> okay. I just gave up. You know, it's so, it's what it is, right? So now the next step I'm going to do is I am going to use a remote control because I want to save time. I do not want to hit start, yeah, right, right, come right. back, and edit things. So I'm interested in speed. Now, is that necessarily the best way to do it? And I'm not saying that. It's simply one way of doing it. It's also consistent with how I make most of my videos for courses, YouTube, and everything else, is I tend to do everything in one take. And I hope to help people more by just putting out more content. Now, the other thing that's a little bit different from this camera angle, the light behind my... Oh, that one's already off, actually. So it is... This light is putting off a little too much. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that one off. But yeah. my accent lights have turned off as a timer. So I'm actually going to turn on. So I'm my own set designer here. <laughs> so we're putting some of those things mm -hmm. back on to look a little better. So now I'm going to attempt to do a vertical short form of 15 seconds. That tends to get the most views on Amazon. And Amazon has so many different places where they can put your video. They have their own thing that's like TikTok called Amazon Inspire, where people are just scrolling all day long, looking at little short videos. So these videos sometimes end up there. So for example, I have, I've been credited with 60 sales of James Clear's Atomic Habits. People watch my video and then right. bought the book. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. I mean, look, you know, breaking through is the is is. Yeah, what I like about it is it's no gatekeepers. I don't have to submit a proposal, have yeah. a Zoom meeting, yeah. send another proposal, yeah. follow up. Are you ready to start? Yeah. Invoice. It's just all automatic. Okay. Yeah. Now so I have some questions right for you after after you're done. 
Sure. And I won't interrupt you now. So my question for you, I want you to listen to me and I want you to give me some extra talking points because we're going to do several ads here. You can put as many ads as you want. Doesn't cost me anything. Each additional ad I have increases the odds. It gets some placement and some sales. So th the, this ad can go on Amazon next to my book? Yes. It's not guaranteed. Some publishers say, well, we don't want influencers things. But most of the time when I do an ad for a book, the publisher either has an automatic setting saying, sure, let it on. And yeah. so it's it typically always shows up within a couple of days. Uh, and you have to have the publisher's permission. Is that what you're saying? You know, I don't know all the intricate details of it. Okay. My impression is when, when a publisher sets up an account on Amazon, there's some setting. Uh, do you, uh, do you automatically want, influencer videos on your site or not. Or I think it may be a negative check off that it's automatically goes on unless they say they don't want it. Some brands are so protective. They only want video they created. Well, that I can see that they want to make sure that whatever is being said isn't going to cause them litigation <laughs> or some other, that some may other be the issue, consequence. But, I, I can see but, that. But uh, you know, Ali Abdal is a well-known YouTuber productivity expert. His book came out end of December. I did three videos and they all went up right away. And I was credited with a bunch of sales. That's wonderful. Uh, our, wow. our mutual colleague, Jess Toddfeld, has a book, Media Training Secrets. I did several ads for that. Boom, it was up the next day. Didn't he used to work for you? Uh, we still work. We still work together. We okay, still so I know, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. 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 He's in the NSA. I remember him. Yes. Okay. And I see Josh has come on. Uh, yes, we'll be able to speak probably in about 15 minutes, Joshua. So if you want to come back or stay on, we're going to talk about other communication. Issues. I just want so to say go one, ahead and yeah, one, one more thing. I'm yes. in the process of creating a new website for, for this book and just this book and with none of the other books because the other books are not as available. This is my primary focus. So, um, just so you know, and I'd love to see how this, these, these videos would be able to be integrated, you know, and they're going to be uploading everything. I mean, it's already on Amazon. So, yeah. um, but anyway, you can pull them from there. If you remind me, I can email you these too. Yeah. Would you please? I'd, sure. I'd, love, to, I'd love to see them and I'm yeah. perfectly happy. With okay. It. Let me hop right in while I've got okay. this. How to start a conversation and make friends. If you think small talk is insignificant, wrong. This book will tell you exactly what to do, how to do it, and give you the confidence you need. Wow. My remote stopped. So I can't use that. <laughs> so two things happened. It timed out and it went dark. Which yeah, I, didn't I saw that. Out. And for whatever reason... I don't know if my battery died at that moment, but typically we do all of these in one take, but every so often. That's terrific. What you're, what, that those, I, I think what you've got here, TJ is, is just right on. So I don't know what happened here because I'm yeah. seeing a lot. This has never happened before. That's me. So one of the things that just challenged people and why more you know, professional speakers and other experts and authors don't do video is video is a lot more complex. There's so many different ways yeah, yeah. that video can mess up. And for, I don't know, I don't know why it has stopped. So I've got to delete that one. It's okay. Just do it again. And this, this time with enthusiasm. Okay. What's that? Okay. <laughs> Take, take two. Take Let 22. me try to sink again. Otherwise, what I have done before, I do these at home and my wife is just the camera person. It's well, there you go. Countdown. But she's not here today. Oh. So I would have to do the ones for this book this weekend when I'm yeah. home if I can't get this. Because the second I do that and that, then it, it opens up this whole door of editing, which confession, I've never learned how to edit. And I don't want to have to take the time to upload it and then 
find send it to an editor and all of that because you're then, a good enough speaker to do 30 second spots for the next four hours and it really anyone can if they just if you speak every day then it's like walking or driving to the grocery yeah, store but it, it's it another skill. it's another skill you have to be able to synthesize and get it out there yeah it, it's but guess what? That's what you do in every small talk conversation. Yeah. You're synthesizing. But, but still, it's, it's, it's doing what you're doing right now is something else. You got to push the buttons. Yeah. So it may be that the battery has gone out. And I do. A, I'll switch that, but I, I won't do it in front of people today. So I will get those up. I promise okay, you, but we can't fine. do send it them, today. Send them to me. I would love to see them. You know what? I take that back. Let, again, part of the premise of this show is we show people the mistakes, the flaws, the procedure, the process. So I've got a battery over here. I want you to promote your book for the next two minutes. I'll be back with a battery and we can do this. If it, if you've got the time. I, I've got the time. Okay. And promote I, your book I, and talk to people. Give a little tutorial and small talk. All right. Well, That's you know, as, as TJ has pointed out, my career has been built around the ability to, to talk to people. And uh, it, it came about from New York City, but it also just came about because my mother told me if I wanted to talk to people, just go ahead and start talking and see what happens. And so part of it is to give yourself permission to reach out to people. And some of the questions that TJ had asked me over our interview, had to do with introverted people who maybe are reluctant to talk because they think that somebody will have a negative impression of them. Maybe they think that they're coming on too strong or that they want something or that they're, um, I, you know, they, they just have, they have, their minds will fill with a lot of negative feelings when, when the opposite is usually true. So I, I want to just encourage you to just give yourself permission. It's okay to be the first to say hello. It's okay to start a conversation with someone if you do it the right way. It's okay to ask questions if you don't ask too many. It's okay to reveal some information about yourself as long as it's not overly personal or goes on too long. So from a mindset perspective, if you feel a little bit shy or uh, not confident to engage people, just remember this. People want your attention. They, they, they want you to show interest in them in a positive way, not in an overt way or in a, in, a, in a negative way. But if you do that, you'll find that people will respond. So how do you be the first to say hello? I always look for something to comment or compliment somebody on. We call that free information. It could be a T-shirt. It could be they're carrying some uh, 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 athletic, you know, piece of equipment, a, a athletic bag, or a baseball bat, or you know, a tennis racket. It doesn't matter what it is. Even a, a bicycle or a car. Anything that you can say to the person, "Wow, that's a great looking bike," or "Is that a violin in that box there that you're carrying?" Something that shows that you notice them in a positive way. This has so much impact. So once you reach that point and, and people say, yeah, it's a violin or, and, and yeah, that, you know, you like my bike? Yeah, it's, I just got it. Oh, where do you ride? So you start to ask some it's very easy to answer questions, not complicated meaning of life questions. This is another thing that shy people say, I don't really like small talk. I like to lot, I like to talk about deep, meaningful conversations and, and topics. That's fine. But when you talk about those type of conversations, you really reveal a lot of personal information. You reveal a lot of opinions. And sometimes those can lead to confrontation. It's not that they're not important, but there's a time and place for them. And in the beginning of a conversation, you want to keep it light. You want to keep it easy. You want to keep it friendly. And you want to keep it balanced back and forth, back and forth. For example, where you live is a perfect opportunity to start. Don, you are the consummate professional. That's how you know 
You are back. ready for prime time and yeah. ready to be a good guest if you can take it. Now, you, that, you could argue that was mean of me to do. You could argue that was unprofessional of me to do. But someone who's got great ideas, who wants to help the world, wants any opportunity they can get to share that. So don't you know, I appreciate it, that. So I found the battery I was looking all for right, in well, about 10 one. seconds. But it had this plastic wrapping on it. Oh, man. I that I could, I'm using my teeth. I'm looking for nails. I'm looking for my scissors. I'm fighting it. I can't get it open. I finally found my pair of scissors. Is that that sign that you said, Don, keep talking? <laughs> yes, yes. So let's let's switch the battery out. And it may be a different issue. I mean, it could be the remote just is not decided to not sync for some reason. So I'm going to do a test. But uh, but this does lead to an important point, I think, for communicators, where anyone who wants to communicate, you don't have to have a PhD in computer science. But I do think you have to know the tools of your era. This is very critical. And if it's a hundred years ago, the tool was basically you stand up on the stump <laughs> and you project. And these days, knowing YouTube, knowing social media, knowing FaceTime, and I see so many people who are smart, intelligent, educated, have a lot to give. And they're, oh, I'm not a techie. Yeah. And so they've never started a YouTube channel or they never, uh, they never switched from using a typewriter to being able to submit a manuscript digitally. So therefore they could never ever publish a book. It's a big problem. So you've got to use the tools because I don't really consider myself a techie. And really what I mean by that is I'm lazy and I don't like to learn new tech stuff sometimes, but it's, you're only punishing yourself. Now let's, let's do a test and see if this actually works now. And Sadly, <laughs> it may be I have to just get a new remote. Let's try it one more time. Ah, you know what occurred to me that I didn't do is, is see, I believe it's a Bluetooth connection. And I think it initially set up the first time. Uh, let me turn Bluetooth off. And, and I realize, folks, this is not Mr. Beast quality video <laughs> suspense, billions of people watching. <laughs> but the reason I don't just hit stop on the feed and I show this is I want people to see, in fact, all the little steps involved, some technology, batteries, different mics that it takes to be a content creator in the modern era and what it takes to be an Amazon influencer if you want to do it quickly simply and efficiently. And so a B sh I'm trying to remember what the name of this one is. This may be the AB shutter. I don't remember, but somehow it lost a connection. Can I stop my cam here for a second or you can take oh. over the full just for a minute? I'll oh, right sure. Back. But but, uh, but we've taken up so much of your time, Don. We can say goodbye now. I really want to thank you. Okay, TJ, it's been a pleasure. I, I love watching you change batteries. It just makes me feel... <laughs> no, you don't. I, I'm not alone. <laughs> but I appreciate here. you lying to me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for having me on your show. And yeah. I look forward to uh, visiting you again. Don, thanks so much. We appreciate it. And we'll let you know when the podcast is out and okay. and all the other bells and whistles that are a part of this all so right thanks have so fun okay thanks thanks so much don gabor ladies and gentlemen a true master of the craft of small talk thanks don thanks okay we have another special guest today uh joshua he is with pc enterprises josh i see you've been you have left a comment i know you've reached out to me and you are a communication expert in your own right uh josh oh i see that you're on on Twitter. So I don't know if you can see the connection. We have a, a, a StreamYard link. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see in the comments the StreamYard link. If you 
go to my community tab on YouTube, you will see the StreamYard link. I don't know that if it actually shows up on Twitter X, but if you want to talk to me, you're going to have to do that. I don't know any other way of doing it. Meanwhile, I'm still trying to figure out why, in fact, my remote control no longer works for my cell phone, which is a bit disappointing because it means I cannot, in fact, create these Amazon influencer videos. I'll have to solve that uh, without you. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Okay. While Josh is trying to figure out if he wants to join us or not and how to do that, I want to shift gears and make some, some short form and perhaps long form videos today. And a number of questions came to me, topics of things I've talked about in the past, but not in quite a while. They came to me because of the training I was doing, in-person trainings earlier this week in Washington, D.C. So let me, let me pull up these topics. Again, the first priority always goes to you if you want to come on screen, ask questions. I'm going to turn my cell phone off. If, and if you want to type in questions, I always give priority to you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go to camera two. Oh, I'm going to stop recording. We got a long, we got a lot of footage today. Note to my editors. Okay. We're going to go back up. Oh, I see Joshua has joined us, so I don't want to keep him on hold any longer. Joshua, how are you? Thanks for joining us today. Thank I you see your mic me. is on. Do you want to put your camera on? You don't have to. Sure. No Would you like to? No problem. There you are. How are you today? I'm doing perfect. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank, and frankly, for being brave. And confession yeah. to you, I get pitched five times a day by different internet marketers and different editors and copywriters. And I always say the same thing because they all want to have a Zoom meeting with me. And I say the same thing. I'm happy to talk to you. Just come on to my live show and everyone's too scared and too chicken to do it. So thank you so much for, for being brave and being willing to talk about your craft. So tell us what you do and how we can possibly work together. Sure. So, yeah, I, I help online business owners build a relationship with their audience via email marketing primarily and the strategy is to build a relationship through frequent emails, compelling emails, emails that the audience finds valuable, of course. And then as email list, as you do the to the email list, you can uh, really, it becomes an, a new revenue avenue because the, the audience is uh, a lot more primed to buy when you're giving them, you know, value and uh, suggestions on what courses to buy and books and things like that. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I don't know a single successful person who doesn't say, oh, your email is the most important thing, in part because YouTube can kick you off. Facebook can kick you off. Twitter can kick you off. Nobody can really take kick you off of email. It's a right. different mm -hmm. protocol, mm -hmm. I guess you would call it. So it's something you can, you can own your own list. Now, you could be banned from certain providers, in, in theory, or blocked, or put on a lot of spam list. But it is something a business owner can own. So I've, I've heard that for years. And the, you know, the, the wealth is in the list. Or you hear again and again and again. I've used email since the 1990s. And I did something really before it was anyone told me it was the wrong thing. But this was probably 1996. I said, hey, I want to communicate with heads of PR at major corporations and PR firms. So someone talked to me into using a scraper and I went in this, that's all considered black hat now and get you spanned, but it wasn't at the time. So I put together a list of say a hundred thousand names of communications, PR officials around the world and had my weekly newsletter going out. Uh, but that, I think, got me on so many spam lists. Even though I've changed providers, I use ConvertKit now. I, I got to tell you, I, I have never sold a thing from email, in my opinion. Now, it's helped me stay connected to clients who already liked me and used me and loved me and mm -hmm. helped build connections. Mm -hmm. But I, I know a lot of people swear by email. 
And for me, it has been absolutely nothing but headaches. It's getting caught in spam. I don't, I can't even get my own newsletter to my own address. Not only does it not come to me, it doesn't even show up in my spam filter. And I'm using ConvertKit, which is, you know, one of the most expensive ones, supposedly is good about that. So I have, have had nothing but bad experiences and frustration with email. And I have clients who, prospects who write to me and say, oh, I never got your proposal just from sending out emails. And I use different accounts. And now I don't even, I have things forwarded to Gmail. Gmail seems like it's a lot worse these days. And stuff that I have filtered from my corporate accounts into Gmail, I don't get. So everyone has a bias. I like to keep an open mind. And I certainly know that many, many successful entrepreneurs, experts, creators, course creators swear that the number one thing in their life is email. It has been nonstop headache and frustration for me. So with that as the setting, I'll turn the floor over to you. Sure. Yeah. No, it's it's very common for business owners because email marketing does take a lot of time and focus and effort because it is a, it is an, a hard game to pull off. And that's where I come in and I help, you know, relieve the stress of email marketing and uh, maybe get, you know, the list back on, on track, as you might call it. And depending on where, how big the list is, it's once you get it on track, it's very easy to monetize it. If you, you know, know a, a bit of things here or there, you know, about email marketing. Mm -hmm. So how do you typically work with someone like me? So I usually set a schedule for emails and that's anywhere, you know, from two to five emails per week. And I, I follow on a basis of providing more value than more sales, right? Because a lot of business owners, they mess up because they always just sell to their audience instead of because their audience is on the email list to, you know, get tips or, you know, actual actionable value from the authority, which is the business owner in this, which like in your perspective, it'd be like, you know, speaking, communication tips, things like that. And then once you do that, the audience is a lot more receptive to the courses and your books and programs that you have. And so I usually, you know, provide more value than sales. But then once I do provide the audience with an opportunity to sell or to buy, it usually goes down a lot better. And that's how you can get a consistent revenue through your email list. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you a little more background, uh, before they called it blogging, I don't know, 2000 one, I guess I started doing a newsletter and I went from once a month to once a week. And then for several years, I did it once a day, seven days a week. And it was basically pure content and it was text only. And I would write about some aspect of how to improve your communication skills. Didn't matter if I was traveling, training, I'd be in the back of a cab typing out a text and then sending it out by email. It was a text only newsletter. And that did establish me, I think, as a thought leader to a lot of people, because I put all my clients on it. And anyone who came to a public workshop, mm -hmm. I put it on it. And I was still, uh, my list was still declining because I was working off this old list where the black hat techniques were used. So I'm going from 100,000 to 90, 80, 70, and it's 2000 today, being fully transparent with you. But it did resonate with a number of clients and, and people who liked me came to a, had a face to face training with me, liked it. They were able to stay connected through my newsletter. Seven days a week writing new original content, as you can imagine, was was pretty tiring. This was before any chat GPT or it was all mm -hmm. having to do it. Then I switched to five days a week. And I forget how long I did that, whether it was another year or another seven years. And at one point I had it automated doing a different system where I had, I had it all automated. So it was evergreen content. And then I gave people the option. Do you want to sign up for once a day, once a week or once a month? So I had all of that going out through, I guess, one shopping cart. I bought one of the, if you've heard of the name Tom Antion, I bought his version of one shopping cart, kickstart cart, and it was all automated. So you could upload evergreen content. 
so that someone who just came into a training this week now, if they want daily, they're getting daily. If they want weekly, they're getting weekly. That at some point that got messed up and one shopping cart didn't stay as up to date as convert kit and MailChimp and the others. So I was convinced to switch to convert kit, which I did, I guess about five years ago. And now uh, what I found is as much time as I put into it or copywriting, it didn't really seem to do much. So the current state of my newsletter is my staff will take my videos and transcribe. It will have automatic transcribing the, the video into text, then put the text into chat GPT and do summaries. So in a typical week, I publish at least 21 videos on public speaking information and co communication skills. We typically will spotlight about five of these videos where we give a summary, several sentences, trying to entice people, letting know the value they'll get out of it. And then below it, it'll have information. You're looking for a training or here's my course or something like that. And as far as I know, we get virtually no sales from it. I mean, my sales, excuse me one second, my autofocus is, we're having troubles with the audio autofocus. So I've got to just pull to a different camera angle or so. Let me go back. So I do that in part because the content we're creating for the newsletter, we then post on my main corporate site, mediatrainingworldwide.com. What we do, what we just started doing a little differently there is instead of having short summaries of five or seven videos, we have short summaries of all but one. And then one of them will convert and use ChatGPT to summarize it where the overall newsletter is at least a thousand words. We then put that on the blog of my website to ostensibly help with the SEO with Google. And if you do type in media training, which is my main key search word traditionally for my business, which is why I named it media training plus one more word.com. If you look at the SEO, if you type in media training, typically 3 billion websites come up. And typically I'm always on the first page. And once you get rid of some spam and spot and ads and a few other unrelated things, I'm typically lately number two. So I'm, I'm happy with the SEO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it because of the newsletter and then the content? Uh, I'm told that that it helps a lot because it's keeping new, fresh content. Mm -hmm every single week and yeah. Google supposedly likes that. So that's how I'm benefiting or that's essentially what I'm doing with mm -hmm. email. My yeah. other big thing is my thing is speaking. So I'm putting a lot more energy and effort and frankly, money and resources to communicate with people by speaking because the, because there's the old New Yorker joke of, of a dog typing on the internet and with the message being on the, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> if you're speaking and people can see you, mm -hmm. it automatically cuts through the competition because most people are afraid to put their face on camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most people are afraid to speak. So I figure since I teach people to speak, I should spend most of my time, energy and effort, creating video live and on demand to speak to people so they can actually see me in part because I like doing it. And I think I'm good at it in part because I know the vast majority of my competitors, media trainers and public speaking coaches are either afraid to put their face on camera or too lazy to figure out the technology. So it's a way for me to differentiate myself more because fewer people are doing that. I mean, to my knowledge, Nobody in the world is putting out a hundred pieces of original video content a month, the way I'm currently doing on all social media platforms. Mm -hmm. There are tons and tons and tons of public speaking coaches and media trainers who put out a perfectly nice newsletter once a week or some frequency. So 
that's been my own rationale. I could be wrong. I would love to figure out some way of communicating with people regularly that helps them and makes me a lot more money. So with that said, let me now close my mouth and listen to you. <laughs> no, it's, that's great. It's good to hear, you know, kind of where you're at and your uh, previous experiences with email marketing because it's everybody's different, has a different story. I think the main problem that I, when I come into businesses and I check over their email marketing, like people pay, you know, for people pay businesses to solve problems. Right. And so in, in this industry, it's, you know, solving their communication problem. Right. And I think though, from what I've seen, most business owners don't like, they don't focus their emails around solving their problem. Right. They might give them like, especially in like maybe the sales email, especially it's easy to just throw a link in there and say, Hey, if you're interested, you know, check this out, which that can work sometimes, but as people will especially be more receptive to your programs, for example, and your products, if they know that it's going to be solving their communication problems. And we, you know, you have to just kind of crank that pain and desire a little bit and like, you know, through, persuasive writing that helps as well. But the main focus is to, you know, show them their problem and then show them the solution and then to segue your product into that. And I think most business owners forget that maybe, and then they don't clearly show the audience, you know, this is your problem, this is your solution. And here's why my product is the best way to solve that problem. And if you do that correctly, I think it can really, you know, the sales take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything you say makes sense. I've, I've spent oh five figures in the last year on various marketing programs mm -hmm. who all say exactly the same thing. Because I was attempting to sell a high-end coaching program, a $5,000 presentation, communication skills coaching program where it was me live once a week with, with everyone, not one-on-one, -on -one, and then you get exercises and then you have access to my online video library and course with a structure for eight weeks. So there's, as you know, there are a lot of people selling this type of hybrid coaching program mm -hmm. in the last two years. It's become quite popular and a lot of people have been very successful with it. So I've spent a fortune going to these gurus, going to their training camps on how to do it, spent a tremendous amount of time and money and effort following that exact procedure. Tell people what the problem is and agitate the, the need and the solution. And it just did not work, or I didn't figure out a way to make it work for this. And the few sales we had, it always came from at least two different sales calls for my team for me and my team and for everyone who actually kept the call 19 would schedule it it's on our calendar and wouldn't show up so even though we made a few sales i didn't see any possible way for it scaling because if i've got to have two separate sales calls to make a, a sale and presumably i would be better at it than someone i've hired to do that there's no way it could scale out because you, you can't hire someone to do this if they've got to make two separate calls before they make a commission. Mm -hmm. So I kind of went back to the drawing board and said, I'm going to focus my energies on trying to sell a, a product that's under a thousand dollars. The conventional wisdom is if you're selling a coaching program, an online course, and it's a below a thousand, you don't have to have, a sales call, a live Zoom call. And I just had such a bad experience with so much time wasting and, and you know, trying to do every best practice. And it just didn't seem to work. So that's why I'm now in the process of changing all my marketing. I hope maybe even as soon as today, where everything we do with all the social media is going to be encouraging people to mm -hmm. go get a live communication skills masterclass for free from me. It sends them to a 75 minute video where I give them real value, talk about their problems, give them very practical solutions. 
and then lead them to a dozen options I have. And mm -hmm. I realized that's against conventional wisdom. You're supposed to give people one choice. They get confused. Yeah. But I, I sell these different products and services at varying degrees. And, and in the past, even ones that weren't successful really led to relationships that ended up with, you know, half a million, million dollar lifetime value to clients. So things like a public workshop that my colleague would be doing in New York, and maybe I would occasionally, I've had situations where, you know, we charge a thousand bucks for a day public workshop. And Hey, if we got 14 people in a good day, but I've had it before where I had one or two people thinking, Oh gosh, we're losing money here, but it formed a relationship because it's in the real world with someone who would have never been able to afford our private courses and the cost of that. But then they liked us so much, they brought us into their organization. Their organization used us for half a million, a million dollars over Correct. 15 yeah. years. Yeah. So that's why I'm trying to plant seeds and just let people know, okay, any aspect of how you want to communicate more effectively I've got a tool for you, a solution for you, mm -hmm. and a price point. If mm -hmm. all you got is nine bucks, we got a PDF. If you got 195 bucks or 295 bucks, maybe you come to one of our live webinars for two hours. If you've got 500 bucks, here's one course. What I'm trying to figure out how to market is you get all of my courses, whether it's 150, 200 courses for $997. I'd like to figure out how to market that. And if I can figure out an email marketing campaign, great. We've got public workshops that are a thousand bucks a day, combo media training and public speaking for $2,000 for a day. And then someone can hire me for a keynote or to do private training for $10,000 a day. So there's different price points. And that's the current state of my marketing, which is about to launch directing people to a revamped tjwalker.com site. Mm -hmm. And for those of you just joining us, hi, I'm TJ Walker. This is the TJ Walker Success Channel. This is the channel where we try to help you become more successful in your professional life and personal life by improving your communication skills and by boosting your confidence in your communication skills, primarily about spoken communication. I'm talking to Joshua now, who is with PC Enterprises, specifically about an area of communication where I'm frankly not as good, text and email marketing. So I don't know everything about every aspect of communication, especially the non-spoken communication. So we're all continuing to try to learn here. And Joshua is coming up with suggestions and giving me advice on how to communicate more effectively through text. Joshua, forgive me for going on a little too long. Let me give you the floor. No yeah. I think one of the main, one of the main uh, most important aspects of email marketing is to attract the right audience, right? And I think it's very, it's it's great what you're doing with uh, YouTube and X and you know tons of video content, which is a very good way to grab attention. And then you one of one of the best ways. But to let me. I apologize for interrupting, but you just put your finger on the what I believe to be the number one problem I have. I've been doing this since 1984. That's right, for 40 years. And I've spent thousands of hours research, thinking, contemplating. And again, just went through these comprehensive marketing gurus courses last year. And I cannot identify my ideal prospect because every mm -hmm. single human being in the entire world has to speak. And if you market to everyone in the world, you will fail. Now, I've seen people who just try to market themselves to entrepreneurs, or they're just trying to market themselves to business owners who want to do social media. The, the, the people who have been most successful in niches similar to mine have positioned themselves as, I'm going to teach you how to make a lot of money every time you speak. And it used to be, I'm going to teach you to be a professional speaker, you know, hire me for 
2,500, $5,000. And you're going to be on the stage with Anthony Robbins in a week. And you're going to be making $50,000 a speech and driving around in limousines. A lot of people made a lot of money doing that. I never did that because I thought it was complete BS because all they're doing is selling a fantasy and it didn't work for anyone. But if you are willing to sell the BS and sell the dream, you could make money on that because then you are saying, you know, here's your problem. You want to be rich and famous. I'm going to make you rich and famous. Give me this money now. So there was a clear marketing path. Mm -hmm. I always felt like that was disingenuous, dishonest, deceitful. And I've never gone down that path. Yes, I do have a course on how to be a professional public speaker, which people can get for like nine bucks on Udemy. So I do help people in that niche somewhat, but I, I'm not comfortable saying, you know, give me $5,000. I'm going to make you a professional speaker because it doesn't work that way. It's, it's much, much, much harder. So when I look at my own business of my traditional training, it is every single industry. Now it's quite often CEOs and top leaders because they're the ones who have the budget where it's not their money, where they can pay the checks for me, but it's every single industry. And when I look at my online students, they're wild. I mean, they're literally every single country in the world, except for North Korea, <laughs> every single continent. Believe me, I actually have students in Antarctica. Wow. So, it's so, so that's part of what's exciting about it and what's nice about it. So if I put out content, YouTube, websites, news, if I put out to the whole world, LinkedIn, prospects come from every place, every mm -hmm. industry, every niche, from one person, consultants, to CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Every single time I try to market and I say, well, here's my, you know, here's my avatar. It's got to be the, you know, head of communications of major banks. It has completely been an unmitigated disaster and gotten zero. And I mean, low return, I mean, zero returns. So that's, and it's different from other industries. You may be familiar with uh, a Sunny Leonard Uzi, who's a fantastic marketer. And her whole thing is she targets people who want to make online courses. If you're a coach, consultant, expert, and you want to make money from your expertise, making an online course, and you don't want to spend a lot of money on advertising, I'm going to show you, meaning Sunny, how to structure your course, structure your marketing, how to make YouTube videos to attract your ideal prospect. So her niche is very, very tight. It's just for people who want to make money selling an online course and creating a business around this online coaching. It's very, very tight and niche. And I don't have, I've never figured out a way that I can narrow my niche to that point. Because once you do that, everything can connect and all your content can flow but that's just not my niche. Yeah. I think one of the main keys is to structure each and every one of your uh, like online business areas in a revolving around certain problems. And then as you do that, you will, it's, I think once you space your industry or your business around solving certain problems, and then you want, and where I like what I would, since I'm obviously a little biased as an email marketer, I always like promoting the email list on social media through via maybe, you know, like a giveaway or, you know, just telling your audience, you know, if you want to solve this problem, you can sign up for here. And then once you do that, it's, it's a lot easier to market to that audience as they're, you know, you know, you know, kind of a bit of what your audience is looking for. And if they sign up for your email list, they're already, you know, in the funnel enough to, you know, be at least sold to. And it's, you know, it helps. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's conceptually, I understand it. I've read, I've read every single book on email marketing and digital marketing and Russell Brunson. I mean, I've studied everything. I've tried everything. It's just never worked for me. And I think it's because in part, I cannot target my niche. 
I just have not figured out a way because every single human being in the world needs to communicate. You're a communicator. Now you're here with me. And so if I were, if you were my client, I would say right away, you'll look a thousand times better if you get the light from behind you in front of you, your face is all shadowy. I can bear, I can't see you. You would look a thousand times better if you put your computer on a stack of books so that the camera is at eye level rather than looking up, which is the least flattering look for everyone. You would look, the, the light you have in the background is the brightest thing in the whole screen. We want the brightest thing on the screen to be your face. So the light you have behind you needs to be off. You need to have a lamp or something in front of you so we can see your face. So everyone has to speak. People mm -hmm. value information like that, but they could be in literally any industry in the world. Mm -hmm. So I've, you know, you may or, you know, it's, it's always difficult giving someone advice that they didn't ask for, they didn't pay for it, that people don't value it. You may or may not take some value from that. And if you saw a video on that for two minutes, you might say, well, that's interesting. But I doubt, I don't want to presume, but I doubt you're ready to pay a thousand bucks for my course on how to look your best on camera when doing pitches. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't at this point, but yeah. I think one, have, like I do have a question. Have you tried any like feedback campaigns specifically to your email list? Like asking them certain questions, like their barriers and roadblocks and you know what they're going through? Yeah. We did all of that. <laughs> yeah. All kinds of surveys from the prospects. From, I mean, I was doing YouTube advertising last year. Mm -hmm. Spent a lot of money on advertising. And again, the problem was how do you target it? We did every kind of variable age, location, income. It's, it's still too broad because everyone in the world at some point is a little uncomfortable about speaking in front of people or speaking in front of a camera. And you may have even felt a little bit of trepidation. Do I really want to go on screen with this guy and other people can see it? I mean, am I right or wrong? Yeah, just everyone, a bit, yeah. everyone has some little bit of insecurity or concern about coming across their best when speaking. But 99% of plus of people are not going to get to that point where they feel like they have to pull out their wallet and buy something. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so hard to target. If you're selling swimming pools, you know, you, you don't target people who live in apartment buildings, right? <laughs> There's just a whole lot of ways you can eliminate 99% of the world. Mm -hmm. You're going to eliminate houses. You're not going to send direct mail to people in, in apartments. You're not going to send mail to people who live in big cities in the urban areas. You're not going to send direct mail or advertise to zip codes where people have houses of at least less than a quarter of acre and probably above 200,000 in value. There's so many ways you can narrow the targeting. Mm -hmm. And I haven't figured that out. Mm -hmm. Hey, Joshua, I do appreciate you stopping by and I, I feel bad me. that I've, I've talked too much and not listened to you. No, so I want to give you an invitation to come back next week, but I've been standing on my feet for three hours now and we're past our, our time of new. We went a little bit long with our, our guest earlier today, but I am, I appreciate your willingness to reach out, but more than that, I appreciate your willingness to actually show up and talk about what you do, because to me, it's, it's, a, it's an irony that so many people who profess to be full-time professional communicators who yeah. say, I'm going to help you get rich and sell millions are afraid to actually speak on camera about what they do. So mm -hmm. you're in the top 1% already because <laughs> the last 99 people I invited to show up here to talk about their wares and their services didn't show, Oh, I can't do that. Or I'll get back to you. Or maybe next month, everyone's got an excuse. Yeah because people are worried that they don't have a good camera or lighting or they want to lose weight or some issue like that. And so feel free to email me with any other additional thoughts. Sure. I'll, frankly, the other issue for me is just simply bandwidth is I'm trying to essentially launch a new podcast. Excuse me. My, my autofocus went off. 
I'm launching a new podcast. I am creating more video content related to helping people speak more effectively than anyone else in the world. And it just takes a tremendous amount of time, energy, thought. And it's where, because I see as an opening, no one else is trying to do that. There, right now, there are literally thousands of communication experts trying to figure out how to write a more effective email. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I shouldn't try to figure it out too, but I do always look for ways of how can I use an unfair advantage to, to compete where there's less competition. Mm -hmm. So for example, five and a half years ago, I said, hmm, I know a lot about storytelling. People that people have a problem, they want to be better storytellers. They know it makes them an interesting speaker. They want to know how to do it. There's a problem. I've been teaching people how to do that for 30 years. Why don't I solve that problem? So I, okay, I could write a book. I went to Amazon, typed in storytelling. There were 10,000 books for sale on Amazon because people like to write and it's easy to write. People are taught how to write. So I figured, okay, I could spend the next year writing a book, hiring illustrators, hiring formatters, copywriters, launching it, promoting it, and have a book that's better than 9,989 books. End up on page two on Amazon and sell two books a year. That doesn't sound very appealing. I then went to the largest online course platform public marketplace platform in the world. Again, this was five and a half years ago, Udemy. I typed in storytelling and there were three courses on it, on the whole site. So I said, hmm, where would I rather compete against 10,000 competitors or against three competitors? So I shelved the idea of doing a book and I did a course and instead of spending a year creating it, I spent like two days creating it. It went to number one. And it's been a bestseller ever since. And it's just printed out a lot of cash. Amazing. So that's so that's one, I guess, bias, I guess you could say. I have sort of against spending more of my mental energy on email. Because presumably, if I, if I had unlimited budget and paid you whatever your full fee is, I'd still have to spend a lot of time looking at what you're doing, giving you ideas, feedback, consultation, it still would take a lot of my time. And I'm not sure that's where I want to spend it versus trying to really create a bigger social media audience through the video content I create. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. I want to be respectful of your time. And I apologize. I didn't give you enough to talk. No, but if no you want problem. to come back next week or send an email, happy sure. to look at anything you sure. say. Thank you for having Thank, me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate right. you. Have a good day. And looking forward to speaking with you more. I'm TJ Walker. Thanks so much for joining me, everyone, this week. It's been a fun week. We'll be back live 9 a.m. to noon Monday, regular time. Also, more videos coming out every single day, every few hours. We do three videos every day in addition to these lives. So please watch the videos, leave comments, like them subscribe to them and share them. Thanks so much.